Number five, Kansas City. Our first video today is gonna to be this clip posted to Reddit from user, oh wow, much fun you guys, which coincidentally is exactly how I feel making these videos for you. It was appropriately titled, Weird Flying Object on Security, which is very good. I like when a title doesn't leave room for guesswork. Let's roll the clip. You see that? It's pretty impossible not to. We'll roll it again just in case you didn't. You can see what looks like an alien mothership sneaking into the frame. Now if you saw that and your jaws open and you're looking for a little bit of context, our dear original poster provided some. There was no sound at all and it was cold so no bugs were making noise either. It wasn't as high as a plane would have been. My next thought was that it was drones. But this would have to have been very elaborate because there was 50 to 100 objects and there were no lights. These objects were solid solid gray with a matte finish and they didn't seem shiny at all. The best way I can describe what I saw was about 50 to 100 gray square objects that were moving in a grid-like fashion, like silky fabric. The way they moved was similar to Aurora Borealis, centralized entirely within this doorstep. My wife and I were so dumbfounded by it all, we would have thought we were insane until we saw this thread. So what do you think, my noble viewers? Is our fair cameraman insane in the membrane, or are the rest of us insane for not seeing the truth? Hey, you let us know down below in that sweet comment box. And if you're looking for more stories about UFO sightings, I have a pretty good feeling I can know where you can find seven more parts worth of it. And if space stuff isn't your jam, why don't you click on through, because we got something scary for just about any topic you can think of, and then some. So click through, hit subscribe and that bell, and don't miss a single scream. But do all that after this video, okay? Keep watching this one. We worked hard-ish on it. I worked hard-ish. All right, moving on. Number four, Israel. Our next clip comes to us from Facebook. You know, good to have one that's not from the UFO subreddit. Try to diversify a little. It was captured in Hedera, Israel, and it features something truly shocking. Let's roll that clip and take a look for yourself. You see it? It was kind of hard not to. Up in the sky, we could see something that does not look like it came from this world, even remotely, looking like some beam of energy floating across the night sky. In fact, I'll be honest, it doesn't look much like a spacecraft to me. As far as unidentified aerial phenomena go, this thing is definitely living up to its name since it's up in the air and I have genuinely no idea what's going on here and I like to think that I know a thing or two about UFOs at this point. I've watched 35 hours worth of clips of them. Some commenters on the clip suggested that maybe this intense pattern of lights could be something on a building, like a neon advertisement for like a casino or something, which I suppose could make sense, but I don't know many billboards that advertise with crazy cool patterns like this. Looks more like a flux capacitor than anything else. I don't really think it's an alien ship either though. I gotta be honest, I really have no idea what this is, totally stumped. Could this be a sign of another life, something more powerful than we could possibly understand manifesting itself in the sky? You know, is this a thunder god kind of deal? Is there a simple explanation for what's causing all of this? Is it just CGI? You let me know what you think about this one sincerely while I keep studying this clip over and over again, just hopelessly confused, hoping desperately to get a new piece of information here. Number three, Montreal. Our next video comes to us from a truck driver from Montreal, which is maybe why I'm including this video out of a sense of some national pride. The clip was posted to Reddit really without much context. The only thing provided is that our sweet driver swears that whatever it was they saw, they were absolutely certain it's not a kite or a balloon, which was gonna be my first two guesses, so cross them off. Let's roll the clip and see if you agree. Pretty weird, right? You saw it, right? We can play it again if you didn't, but I hope you did. Take a real good look up in the clouds to make out that strange gray oblong just floating along. Whatever is following this driver as he makes his route is definitely weird. 
It's got no flashing lights or no quick dashes to hyperspeed, but it's not really got the silhouette of an aerial vehicle. It doesn't look like a plane or a drone or anything. At first glance, it does make some sense why you might think it's a balloon. Definitely a lot of people on Reddit thought it might have been a balloon. There were also several Redditors who, when the clip was posted, argued that this was a Border Patrol blimp, which I had never seen one before. So if you're seeing one for the first time as well, uh, let me introduce one of the silliest shapes we've ever put inside the sky. Uh, what did I just call it? A Border Patrol blimp? Ridiculous looking thing. So what do we think out there, my top five scary gang? Is this clip full of hot air? Or could this be a sign of some unknown visitors in the sky telling us that we should keep on trucking? Our next clip, number two, Rome. Our next clip comes to us from Reddit as well. It's a very short clip, but hey, sometimes the short ones are the best ones, you know? Keep it short and sweet and all that. Let's let the clip do the talking here and let's roll that clip. We liking this? We liking the, the roll thing? Did you see it? Of course you did. I don't even know why I'm asking. This one is clear as day. There's nothing else in the sky except for the flashing alien lights that are distracting your eyes from looking at anything else. These lights are definitely intimidating, you know? It kind of looks like the predator is out there watching and hunting this train. Those little like laser sight things look exactly like the laser sights on his little shoulder cannon. Now what I think is interesting is we've seen a couple of these sightings like these on this specific series. Go back and watch the other old seven, which is making me wonder if there's an explanation somewhere out to be found for these triangular patterns of flashing lights to explain why they keep coming up with such regularity. Drones are what comes to mind as always, and it's usually what comment sections seem to think because we can make drones do pretty impressive things. If you ever see those displays of like drones making pictures in the night sky, it's possible. But the set of lights don't seem to be moving too much, or at least the train is going significantly faster than they are, which does make me wonder if maybe these lights are stationary, perchance. If these could be lights from the top of a building, maybe off a radio tower or something. Or could these be three perfectly coordinated alien scouts watching from up above? Now, some detractors and skeptics suggested that it could be as simple as a trick of the light or something reflecting in a strange way. Although if you're like me and you watch the video about a hundred times, like I do every time I make one of these things, you'll see it pass extremely briefly behind a signpost, like a single second. Meaning whatever this thing is, it's way off in the background. So what do we think? Could this have been a close encounter of the third kind? Or is this train of thought just hopeless? Puns for all my, my scholars out there. You'll get that on the car ride home. And number one, Ontario. Hey, what a lovely coincidence because this clip is also a series of mysterious orange flashing lights moving in a triangular fashion. I told you these are a recognized phenomenon. Nobody believes me. Anyway. Let's let the clip do more of the talking. Roll that clip. Did you see it? Those flashing lights shooting across the night sky like they were on a mission? Looks like an incredibly similar thing to the sighting from the previous video. I promise you I didn't arrange it like this intentionally. That just happened. Movie magic. I did some digging between now and the last point I just spoke about, and in the last 30 seconds, I've come to understand there's a popular conspiracy theory regarding a secret alleged black ops stealth aircraft called the Manta Ray TR-3, a hypothetical triangular aircraft that some UAP enthusiasts believe to be tied to several reportings of triangular UFOs like the one you saw in these last two videos. Now, it would make sense and it's definitely something I want to be cognizant about when I'm making UAP content is probably, if we're being honest, more likely, if anything, strange stuff we see up in the sky could be advanced government technology more than it would be little gray men passing through the clouds. In fact, the CIA themselves believe that over 50% of reports of all unidentified aerial phenomena throughout the 50s and 60s were merely people citing the U-2 spy plane while it was being tested and believing that that's what they were looking at. But 
you know, if you're watching part eight of this series and you're still believing what the CIA tells you, I can't help you. But is that what's happening here? Are we just seeing spy crafts up above? It does beg the small question, why would a spy craft whose aim is to literally fly under the radar unnoticed have glowing lights giving away its presence? But I don't know. I don't design secret spy planes. I just talk about glowing lights in the sky at great lengths. Number five, Bonita Springs, Florida. Our first clip today is going to be coming to us from the UFO subreddit because really, where else? The UFO subreddit is doing more to get alien content out in the open than any world government is willing to, so if they're not going to do it, we got to let the guys online pick up the slack. This clip was posted to us from user Marcus1640, who had this to say. Well, let's roll the clip though first, I think. I was working in my garage, which is about 100 feet west of this camera location, doing the things you do to keep the wife happy. The sky's clear, and out the corner of my eyes, I see this bright ball getting bigger and bigger. It was really bright and then faded away fast. It wasn't a meteor, and I checked planes live. Nothing was close. I'm in Florida, so this stuff is pretty common, but this was weird and no noise. Now in the clip, it can be a bit hard to see, so I'll guide you through this, definitely as well, because it isn't black and white, which does take away some of it. But we see a bright light up in the sky that comes into frame, hovers around a little bit, it kind of seems like it's scoping out the situation, and then flies out of frame after, I guess, it decides there's nothing happening. Now, OP said that the ball of light when he saw it come into frame was this shining, radiant orange, impressively bright in the night sky, obviously, that doesn't translate super well, so we have to use our imagination just a little bit, you know? Close your eyes and imagine it's bright and orange. Wow, what a lovely shade you used. Now some speculation in the comment section of Reddit had people wondering if possibly this could be something like space debris burning up on re-entry or a satellite reflecting the sunlight down to Earth for but a second. Pretty difficult to tell from here, but that's the way it goes with the paranormal sometimes. Nothing can ever be so easy and would we really want it to be? I think we should have to fight, you know, fight for it just a little bit. Fight to get the truth out there. And as usual, my friends, if you're looking for more UFO sightings and content, I have a pretty good idea of where you can find more of it. We've got eight parts worth of UFO sightings from 2023 alone. If you haven't clicked on through yet, you gotta catch up. And if UFO videos aren't your jam and you clicked on this out of accident, we've got loads more scary content for you, ranging from the macabre and mysterious to the outright horrific and hard to believe. Click on through and find something to scream at and subscribe and help us out. It mean a lot from old day. Number four, the Netherlands. Our next sighting is gonna come to us from the Netherlands. Seems even aliens can't resist hitting up Amsterdam. Let's roll the clip first to get your eyes on it, and then we're gonna take a quick listen to the description posted by its witness who's remained anonymous. Just before 6 p.m. in front of the cinema in Scheveningen? Scheveningen? There's no way I'm pronouncing that right. I noticed this object. While viewing this object, it almost did not move at all. In the entire 20 minutes I was there, the object floated very slowly once to the left and right, and then twice up and down. The shape remained exactly the same throughout. The size remained the same, regardless of whether or not this object moved up, down, left, or to the right. And there were no lights to be seen on it. Everything was completely black, and it looked like there was a smudge in the sky. In terms of height, uh, this is unfortunately impossible for me to estimate. But there were several people who, like me, took photos and videos. The object was visible for about 20 minutes. Now the video we've included was pretty short. In fact, those 10 seconds were all that was in that video anyway. But when that video was posted to Reddit, it was corroborated by a few other sources who had all seen the same thing and posted similar videos. Meaning, this isn't some CGI trick, or if it is, a lot of people are in on this conspiracy. So what do we think this could possibly be? The usual suspect of it being a strange blimp or a balloon is always a possibility, and I've seen enough of these videos now that I'm always instantly like, this is probably just a balloon, isn't it? But it's still very, very weird. So. Let me know down below what you think. I love hearing from you guys about what you think on all this. Number three, Phoenix, Arizona. This next clip was first posted to TikTok, but since being posted there has been making the rounds across the web since it's got UAP enthusiasts like yours truly peering their eyes open and gluing them to the screen. Let's take a look and you'll all tell me what you think, okay?
Now, whatever is going on in there is definitely odd. That much I can say with absolute certainty. There's something up there in the clouds that's floating above almost menacingly. Maybe that's just me. And it's flashing a light brightly and I swear it almost looks like it's turning invisible over and over again. The thing seems to be slowly moving across the sky in a way that makes it look like it's scanning the surroundings. Naturally, commenters went a bit wild with this clip speculating like I am now. Some suggested that this could be something like hyper advanced military technology being tested out in the field, which would definitely be exciting and honestly more probable than not, I feel like there's a lot the government don't tell you about what they're working on. The CIA themselves even said that they think most alien sightings in the 50s and 60s were just reports of the U-2 spy craft. Others suggested that this could be something as dull as a civilian drone being flown around in the sky with a lighting rig attached for no other purpose than to drum up attention and get some TikTok views. But do you really think someone would do that? Someone would go on the internet and just lie for attention? <sighs> I don't know. Meanwhile, more than a few people on the original TikTok were very convinced that this was a proper UAP alien sighting and could have been an alien visitor caught on tape. Comment section, I'm gonna toss this one over to you as always. Me, personally, I'm a little inclined to believe this might be a boring one, this could just be a drone, just because I'm not so sure that our alien visitors would give themselves away so easily by attaching lights to their crafts and letting themselves get identified. Definitely smaller than a plane, but a lot bigger than drones. They had no lights, no wings, no windows, and no propellers. They also made no noise. These objects look much bigger in real life than they did in the video. On film, they appear to be black, but in real life, I would say they had a color similar to a cloud. Not quite, way, not quite white, but not quite gray either. They looked to be spheroid or tic-tac shaped, and they looked solid and metallic. They seemed like they had smoke coming out of them sometimes, but it was hard to know if that was just them moving through the clouds, causing an effect that looked like smoke. In terms of height, they were flying about twice the height of a typical city building, definitely lower than a plane would have. Also, may I just say, as someone who watches a lot of UFO clips, to be able to find one that is clear as day, filmed on a high quality camera, recorded for a good amount of time, and also had a lot of context provided, put this thing in a museum. That is one in a billion. I don't even care if these things aren't aliens. Those three qualities are more exciting than aliens to me. Now, when this clip was posted to Reddit, there were a few people speculating that these could be balloons, despite the original poster pointing out that they thought the things were emanating smoke, so it's, no pun intended, a bit up in the air what these things might be. We get reports of cuboid or tic-tac-like UFOs a lot in this video series, which does make me think there's something suspicious going on. If so many people report on similar objects like that, but we still don't have any answers. I hope we get there someday. I know the truth is out there. Number one, Hollywood. Our final entry for this video is going to come to us from Hollywood, even aliens like the tourist hotspots. Let's roll the clip and I'll add the commentary and speculation afterwards, because this one's a good one. There's a reason I saved it for the last. Now, the original poster and uploader stated, we noticed this huge object in the sky just sitting there by the Hard Rock Casino in Hollywood, Florida. Whoa, 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 stop the track, stop the video. Are there two Hollywoods? I'm a Canadian, so I don't know these things. Is Florida in LA? You guys have to fix that for me. Okay, moving back, anyway. The object blurred itself out when we started recording it. It was huge. It didn't do much, but it just sort of sat there and blurred itself out. I have tried to Google to find out what it was, but I'm coming up with nothing. It was my husband, my two kids, and I who witnessed this together. Now, I gotta admit, this is one of the most compelling bits of UFO evidence I have seen in a minute. Not to throw the other four clips under the bus, they're all very lovely in their own way, and I hold them all in my heart dearly, but this one, oh baby, this is the golden ticket. I'm sure there might be a reasonable explanation for it, but on first glance, this thing looks like the definitive flying saucer. Like if you close your eyes and imagine a flying saucer, you start imagining this. It even looks like if you're watching this thing with eagle eyes that the saucer at one point cloaks, and the original poster mentions that it was blurring itself out when they started recording. Very interesting to me. That would explain a lot 
over the years. If aliens have been specifically constructing their crafts to blur them out from being recorded by cell phones. I mean, imagine. Imagine aliens keep coming to Earth just for like vacation and they're getting so annoyed that they're trying to just have some fun, be tourists, and people cannot stop taking photos of them. So they're blurring out their crafts. So what do we think, my ghouls and goblins? Is this recording simply too good to be true? Is this movie magic and CGI up there? You do have to wonder why if this footage didn't set the internet ablaze because that looks about as flying saucery as anything could possibly get. Of course, maybe the men in black and the higher ups are trying to scrub this clip from the internet and don't want you to see and maybe I just got the whole channel in trouble. Number five, alien gate crashers. Our first story comes from a man in Zimbabwe who was asleep one night when he woke up to see an alien craft that seemingly had no trouble passing through solid objects. This is his recollection of the event. My name is Johan Reitman, and I farm near Feathersdorp, 150 kilometers from Herer. I am 31 years old. On the 5th of February, I woke up from a bad dream just after midnight, when I heard a car go past. I got up and looked out of the bedroom window, which faces the front of the farm. I watched as two cars passed each other, a strange sight, as there are usually few vehicles to be seen, and none at night. One car pulled into my gate, and I thought immediately, oh no, those guys are coming to pinch my new engine on the borehole. I rubbed my eyes and face to make sure I wasn't still asleep. I looked at the car again. It was long and wide, and made a low humming sound. I could see lights at the back, a row of red lights and a front light which shone high enough to illuminate the treetops. This car or object stopped at my gate for a good 30 seconds and then drove on as if the gate had been opened and that was it. It was gone. I took my torch, my rifle, four farm workers and my dogs and we went out to the gate. Despite the fact that it had just rained, there were no tire tracks or human tracks on the road. As we approached the gate, I could feel heat coming up from the surface of the road, a really oppressive heat radiating from the ground. Even my ears felt flushed with heat, and my workers and I were soaked with perspiration. It was about 12.30 by then, so when we found nothing further, we all went back home. It was only the following morning that it occurred to me that when we reached the gate, it was closed. This meant that the car had disappeared through a closed gate because they had been watching it when it disappeared and the gate hadn't moved. The next day, I sent one of the farm workers to fetch some sheep who were lost in the bush. And on his way back, he said he saw an object straddling the road. By the time he reached the spot, it was gone. But strangely enough, the sheep would not walk over to the area where the object had been. Instead, they divided around it. Number four, a UFO crash in Greece. Our next report comes from Georg and Pantaloas, who interviewed the witnesses of a UFO crash in Megas Platinos in Greece. The following is quoted directly from his report. At 0300 hours that night, shepherds and some villagers observed a small group of five to six UFOs approaching the area from the north. One of them had an unstable flight and seemed to be having a problem. Strange lights came came out of the UFO's fuselage, but without any noise. As an eyewitness, Shepard Trantos Karatranos told me, suddenly the treble UFO lost altitude and crashed to the ground at a distance of about 500 meters away from him. He didn't hear any noise, but a fire started burning the bushes. Trantos was very afraid to get closer and stayed in his position watching the phenomenon. The rest of the UFOs in this group stopped over the accident spot, and two of them landed near the destroyed UFO. In a few minutes, the fire in the bushes was terminated. For the rest of the night till dawn, there was an unusual traffic from the ground to the flying UFOs. Light spots went up and down, probably collecting the pieces of the destroyed UFO and any bodies of the crew. They finished the collection before sunrise, and after that, the rest of the UFOs took off and were lost in the sky. Meanwhile, all the villagers had been awakened and had seen the whole operation. Early in the morning, the villagers went out to the spot where all of this had occurred, and they saw on the ground a burned oval shape in the ground, with a cut pine tree in the center, and very small metallic pieces, and pieces of wires around the tree. Some of the people, like Aragus Alavantes, collected a number of these pieces 
pieces. One strange thing was that at the edges of the burned oval, the fire stopped like it had been cut by a knife. Some hours later, a team of Hellenic Air Force personnel came into the area and told the villagers that this was nothing serious. Maybe a Soviet satellite crashed or a plane. They took some pieces of the UFO too and left the area. Argaris sent a piece of the UFO to the Space Research Institute in Brussels. That's the story. If you think that we need more information, we can get more, because I have a very good relationship with the people in the village of Magus Plantos. You see, they don't like to talk a lot about this story, because they are afraid that someone will think they are crazy or something. Number three, an unexpected police sighting. The next story on our list was related by a Lithuanian police chief, whose officers witnessed strange UFO activity that resulted in him having to make the press rounds to reassure the people of his country. As he put it, I am chief of police in villainous Lithuania. Recently, I had to appear on the radio to explain that two policemen who had reported seeing something extraordinary were known to me to be reliable witnesses and were of sound and honest mind. There has been considerable public anxiety about this matter, arising from what I consider to be media hysteria about their official report. Earlier this year, the entire police force was put on alert. The two officers stated that they had observed a round shining object on the main route at around half past midnight, 10 kilometers from the capital city near the village of Nemegis. The object was flashing bright light and hovered 20 to 30 meters above the ground. At the same time, you could hear a strange sound, like electricity crackling, they said. The two men approached the UFO after watching it for almost half an hour. When they were some 50 meters from it, the object started to move upwards and away from them into the air, then accelerated towards the town. At that point, an alert was put out and van loads of rapid reaction force police and tracker dogs arrived on the scene, but the UFO had disappeared. We conducted official tests on the area's ground composition, measuring the air radiation and took sound recordings. The grass in the area for 10 meters around where the UFO was reported to have been sighted was visibly flattened. Number two, a Swedish abduction. Our next tale is from a Swedish man who was walking home one night when he suddenly saw a strange light that seemed to instantly transport him to his destination. The following is his story in his own words. Call me Anders. In early March, I left a local election celebration and decided to walk home, about five kilometers away. I had a few glasses, but was still sober. It was a starry, moonlit night, and I decided to take a shortcut that led over a hill. As I was climbing, a bright light came from behind, which I thought was a fast car. I moved off the road onto the grass verge, and then I realized it was not a car. The light passed right over me, almost touching my head very quick. Then I found myself immediately outside my home, my home in Lindholmen, ringing the doorbell frantically. When my wife opened the door, she saw that I had a wound in my forehead and my cheek was burnt. The next day, I telephoned the National Defense and was interviewed in detail by two investigators. They told me there were other witnesses. A woman cyclist reported seeing a light at the same time I did, and a couple driving nearby saw what they thought was a new water tower with extremely bright lights shining out of its windows. Later, they realized there was no water tower at that spot. I still have a scar on my face to this day. Whenever I touch it, I feel a tingling sensation and I experience a wonderful feeling of oneness, of unity, with the Earth itself. Number one, a strange sighting in Uruguay. Our final tale of the day comes from a police chief in Uruguay who was out with friends when the sights he saw made him a believer. In his own words, I am police chief Miguel Costa, in charge of the force at Melo, Uruguay. On March 10th, I was driving with two friends, Armando and Maria Passa, along a gravel road near Tacurembo, when a huge oval disc loomed out of the early morning darkness. It was enormous and gleaming, with yellow and orange lights. I stopped the car and purely on impulse flashed the headlights. All of a sudden, the UFO appeared to hesitate and zigzag up and back as if answering our call. When I started up again, it was following us. I again stopped the car and flashed my lights. Again, the UFO appeared to waver in reply. We drove on once more along the twisting road, and the UFO stayed with us, always about half a kilometer away. This went on for almost 50 kilometers. That's when the strangest thing of all occurred. We were all glued to the windows, watching as the disc suddenly shot towards the ground 
as if it was going to crash. It stopped 50 to 100 meters from the Earth, and we could clearly see its round, dome-like shape with a large flat plate underneath. There was a slight ring of cloud around the dome. The top was reddish, but the bottom was a brilliant glowing white. Inexplicably, the new position of the UFO made us all uneasy, so we turned around and headed back to Takarambo, the nearest town. The blazing lights of the UFO remained at a constant distance behind us. I pulled in under some trees, hoping to evade it. We then observed a second disc traveling some distance behind the first. They never touched, but they seemed to be traveling together. They seemed to maneuver up and down until clouds started to form. Then they passed over the top of the clouds and lit them up like a halo. Then they faded, getting smaller and smaller until they disappeared at dawn. They had been with us for 90 minutes. We were all speechless, as we could not believe what we had witnessed. I myself have never believed in UFOs, but I do know that this incident revealed something rare and inexplicable. Number 5. Red Eyeball Ship In January of this year, a man in Spokane, Washington was in his living room when he happened to sight a strange alien craft that caused him to question his beliefs and his place in the universe. In his own words, Our backyard camera recorded this strange object. We put a camera in our backyard because stuff has been coming up missing. But one morning I had the TV on in my living room as I was sitting on our couch. I happened to look up at the TV and saw this strange object. I went out on the back porch and I couldn't see that object at all. But when I went back in the house, it was still there. I went to get my brother to show him what I was seeing. He didn't know what it was, but he was seeing it too. Then it started to move out in the field where I didn't see it anymore. Then, it started to come back towards my backyard. Again, it looks round, with a red eyeball in the middle. But, I have no clue to this day what it is. I took a couple photos in infrared. If you look in the center of the red, you can see something. Looking at the photos, it is difficult to come up with another explanation for what this strange, unidentified flying object could be. Number 4. An American UFO Our next tale was posted this year but details an experience from the year 1980. The witness shared his story of seeing a UFO that seemed to be affiliated with the US government, but he also posits a theory about why the government would allow this ship to be seen by the public. I had a sighting in broad daylight in 1980 at around 9 a.m. in early December. My mom and hundreds of other motorists witnessed it as well. We were driving to visit my father at his work in Beverly Hills and were waiting to hop on the freeway in Santa Monica when we saw your classic silver disc. It hovered completely still at about 150 feet or so for 10 solid minutes. Remember, we were crawling slow as molasses traffic. We got a very good look at this thing. On the underside, to my eyes, seemed like it was taking the form of a sphere, condensing in on itself from time to time and rippling, as if the surface rippled like water. The light from it appeared that way. It was circular, bright, white, almost silvery. At times, it seemed that the light coming from it had faded, and I could see that it was a solid sphere, silver in appearance. I do not know how big it would be. A guess would be the size of a two-seater passenger plane. It darted from above the school to the hospital in a blink of an eye. The distance was about a quarter of a kilometer, but on a somewhat linear path. I had my eyes glued to it, and it blinked out of existence. It is the only way I can describe it. I could no longer see it. I scanned around the sky with the binoculars, then found it was above a church about a full kilometer away. Same strange ball rippling like metal. I was outside for, I believe, 25 to 30 minutes. Based on my coming back in between 3.30 a.m. and 4 a.m., my brain could not comprehend what I was seeing. I literally thought I was dreaming or experiencing some kind of hallucination. I felt as if what I was seeing was straight out of a movie or sci-fi book. It was like it was darting around our entire town at random intervals, going from one part to another within the blink of an eye. The distance it traveled from the school to the hospital to the church is in total 1.4 kilometers. I snapped, and for some reason started crying. I ran to my dad and woke him up. It's a satellite, is what he said. My father enjoyed watching stuff on UFOs and personally believed the US government covered something up about Roswell. But I never really said too much. He told me to go to sleep. I was terrified for whatever reason. I was so scared after it. 
I did not sleep for months unless one of my parents was awake while I fell asleep. I really struggled with whatever I experienced that night for a very long time. It was a horrific experience for me and hard to even talk about. I had extreme anxiety and depression from it. I was only a teenager, just barely. I found myself being paranoid. I did not want to be alone at all. Anywhere, in the daytime, I would make sure I always knew where someone was. I was never alone. I was so afraid, I started saying prayers. I spent the next five years looking at everything I could that was related to UFOs. The sensation I had from it. I felt a oneness, kind of, but also so completely overwhelmed with fear. It felt as if my skin was trying to escape my body. My spine burned, and the entire time I was filled with thoughts of, this is amazing, and I'm going to die. I need to get in the house. All the hair on my body was standing up. I was sweating. When I got in the house, my shirt was nearly stuck to me in sweat. My father thought I went outside and got attacked and ran away. I was crying and rambling about some craft in the sky and how it was going to get me. My father told me he never saw anyone so absolutely terrified before, that I was nervous and would look out the windows at night to make sure I was okay. I've never been so afraid in my life of anything. My body was telling me I was going to die. My father didn't like me waking him so I could sleep. My mother, well, was not in the picture. My father's reaction is based off of a sighting he had in the 70s that some people in the town saw. He was ridiculed by people for talking about the craft he saw so close to the ground, it looked like it was going to land in the blink of an eye. It darted off and was gone. He said it was circular in shape, like the classic UFO, glowed bright yellow, and had a low hum to it. He doesn't really like talking about it. Number two, another father-son tale. Next, we have a story from a man who was not a believer in alien life until one night his young son pointed out something in the night sky to him. In his own words, I was in my home in Almond, Michigan. That time of year, it gets quite dark quite early. It must have been around 8 p.m. My son, who at the time was 12, came running into the house, saying there was a UFO right outside our house. Let me add, at this point, I was not one who believed in UFOs. I went outside, and my son pointed south and upwards and said, Look. The funny thing was, at first I didn't see anything. But I did notice it was unusually dark. Then I noticed a very dim light. I suddenly realized that the reason it was so dark was that there was a huge craft right over our driveway. It was at tree level and was moving north at a very slow pace, approximately a slow walking speed. There was a very distinct humming, exactly like a large transformer humming. There was a very dull light in the middle, and as it traveled down our driveway, I made out a row of windows around the craft. The windows looked very large. I remember walking down the driveway with my son. The next thing I remember is standing out in the field north of my house, still looking at the UFO, when suddenly it went from approximately 90 or 100 feet straight up in the sky to where it was a pinpoint of light. It just looked like another star. This happened in under a second. We continued to watch it for quite a while when it took off in a northwesterly direction, like a meteor, and was gone in a second. There are a lot of things I can describe if you are interested, but this is the basic part. I don't feel like I was abducted, but honestly, I do not remember how I got from my driveway and then into the field. Number one, Bigfoot, Alien Hunter. Our final story is perhaps the most insane sounding story I've ever read. It began when a group of friends went to stay in a cabin in Missoula, Montana. At first, everything seemed normal until they looked to the sky after dinner on their first night, as one of the witnesses reported. Right there, hovering above the meadow at almost the level of the hills off in the distance, it appeared to be a triangular shape slash sphere shaped like an arrowhead. It had a flashing red light at each point, and they flashed at the same time. Slowly, the craft started turning until it was pointing right in our direction. We all squealed with nervousness. We all convinced ourselves and each other that it was much too far away and that there was no way it could see us. Jason got up and turned the outside lights off. Then, the object turned off its lights. When Jason turned them back on, it did as well. They did this a few more times, with the craft always copying their actions. Then, with no warning, it just shot forward and then came to a dead stop over top of us. And when it stopped that quickly, it seemed that the momentum made the front end point downwards right at us. The group ran inside and hid, with one of them eventually working up the courage to look out the window, only to see yet another rare sight. Bigfoot. The witness kept quiet about this because, you know, one thing at a time, but that night heard bipedal footsteps on the roof of the cabin. The next morning, two of the friends went to the river to fish, and the others had coffee on the porch, but looked to the tree line and saw the drivers of the alien craft. I saw as clear as day what is commonly called a gray alien. Its big bulbous head was peeking out from behind a tree, and I saw its dark almond-shaped eyes and the tiny nose with two very small holes. I'm not sure if it felt me looking at it, but it slowly moved back behind the tree. 
At that point, the fishermen came running back, saying that they had crossed paths with Bigfoot again. Forty feet into the woods of mainly ponderosa pine, they saw the Bigfoot. It walked step by step with them, and then it looked over at them and realized they were watching it. That's when it started walking towards them. They started running, and they saw that it was walking as quickly as they ran. When they made it through the woods, they got to a clearing they ran with everything they had. They said it was dark brown in color and maybe seven feet tall. Its hair was bushy in spots. Most people go their entire lives without seeing aliens, Bigfoot, or UFOs. So the fact that this trip to the cabin resulted in a hat trick is pretty impressive. If this is true, why was Bigfoot so close to an alien craft? Is he perhaps an alien as well? Is he a Wookiee? Number five, the crafts shot down. It has been a huge year for UFO enthusiasts like yours truly. Earlier, we got the release of the UAP reports from the Pentagon, which were basically the wildest documents in US government history, where the Pentagon confirmed they've been researching UFOs and kind of just slid it under the door like nobody cared. It made UFOs more than tinfoil hat talk, almost made discussions about it reputable. And I guess since then, that wasn't enough to keep us all entertained. As of last week, we've turned things up up even more since we've had two mysterious aircrafts shot down and the United States and Canadian governments are being pretty cagey about it. So let's run through a quick timeline of what hopefully doesn't turn out to be Independence Day and let's all pray we didn't kickstart an intergalactic war. On February 10th, a US fighter jet brought down a currently unidentified object soaring over the coast of Alaska. The object shattered into pieces after being shot down and was confirmed to most likely not be a balloon according to the Department of Defense. I I guess that's good to know, or not at all, since it doesn't answer anybody's questions. A White House official referred to the object as being the size of a small car, with enough room for a family of four to five aliens to fit comfortably, and you can put the back seat up and put some stuff in the storage. This would already be enough to fuel speculation for 10 years, and then literally the next day, February 11th, another unidentified flying object was shot down, this time over Canada, around the Yukon, that's the province that borders Alaska. A US flown F-22 Raptor shot down the second object, which was described as smaller than the first and cylindrical in nature. Okay, well, that's all the weird stuff that happened this week. Nope, because on the 12th, another strange object was shot down over Lake Huron. An object that first had appeared over Montana appeared on Sunday, which was then shot down. It was octagonal, apparently, and it had strings hanging off of it, but it wasn't carrying anything, so no one knows why. Maybe it was just an Amazon drone. Now, things keep getting weirder, I swear to you. Listen to this next part. You're not going to believe this. When an Air Force commander, Glenn Van Herc, was asked directly on whether or not he thought any of these objects were alien in nature, he said, I haven't ruled anything out at this point. What? <laughs> I, I, I can't even speak, but the current sitting government, government officials are like, hey, maybe it's aliens, shrugging their shoulders. Is this it? Guys, is this it? They didn't specify whether or not these objects posed a threat. They said they just posed a threat to civilian air traffic, but the White House did say that these objects were broadcast signals. I would say watch this space for updates, but really just like watch regular space. At this rate, there's going to be an alien every single day. But if you can't wait for any more and you just want to watch alien videos all day, I completely agree with you. That's what I do every day and it's great. We've got loads of alien and UFO vids, NASA conspiracies, and hey, if that's not your jam, we got scary stories, horror movies, monsters, cryptids, true crime, baby, we got just about everything spooky under the sun and above it. So stay subscribed to Top 5 Scary, but most importantly, stay scared. But subscribe after. We gotta finish this video first. We got way more alien footage to get through. Moving on. Number four, the Picket Post Arizona sighting. Well, with all of this stuff flying around in the sky these days, is it any surprise that people are catching more weird footage than ever before? The UFO subreddit has been lit up like fireworks on the 4th of July with all kinds of alien sightings from all across the globe. Come take a look at some of the best ones I've seen this week. Hopefully they're new to you as well. Our first sighting comes to us from a redditor by the username of MaxKeller96. And they posted a short clip from Picket Post Arizona that's got us talking. Take a quick little look-see. This is one of the better ones I've seen in a minute. Here's what the Redditor had to say about the clip. My sister, dad, and I were out hiking near Picket Post when one of us noticed something glimmering near the mountain, so we stopped to take a look at it. All I could make out was that it was a small bright dot in the sky. After a good 15 seconds of staring, I started recording. It then dropped what looked like two flares, though my sister swears she counted at least three. Up until that point, I thought it might have been a helicopter 
helicopter as there's all sorts of army stuff out there, but there's no way anything can accelerate that fast. We all lost sight of it nearly instantly after the video cuts and we were pretty freaked out about it. I've replayed it about a hundred times and I've tried showing it to everyone and no one has any idea other than that it could be a super advanced drone. So if you think you know, please let me know. Well, you heard the guy. If you think you have any ideas to what's going on, you comment down below or jump into the Reddit thread and participate in the UFO discussion. The UFO subreddit is great and they're very friendly to new visitors. That's like their whole thing. They really want to welcome new visitors. Number three, the San Diego sighting. The San Diego and Tijuana sighting, to be more accurate. Our next entry is a pretty interesting one because it isn't just one offhanded sighting that happened in the middle of the night by somebody stumbling out in a bathrobe who's half awake, but it's a corroborated sighting that was happening seemingly across the cities of Tijuana and San Diego. And it wasn't even while Comic-Con was happening, so this isn't part of an extremely elaborate campaign for Ant-Man 4 or anything. So we either have a mass hallucination on our hands because they were something in the water, or there's some questions in the sky that need to get answered. So we'll play a few seconds of some of these clips and help you come to your own conclusions. On September 19th, 2022, several of these videos were captured of these bizarre light patterns darting across the sky. This is a massive sighting, so we can't quite dismiss this as a a trick of the light or one isolated incident. There was definitely something weird flying up and around. What makes this kind of notable, besides from, you know, how well documented this is, is I would say the pattern of the lights. They don't really follow like a flare pattern at all, so I don't think it's something that was dropped from an aircraft. When you watch it, they almost kind of seem to move in like a perfect unison, like, like flashy geese. <laughs> the original poster who posted the compilation clip to Reddit added as well that another oddity they noted was that after the lights were seen and military fighter jets surrounding and circling the skies, probably to round up whatever was going on. So comment section, I'll throw it back to you again. What do you think? Spy drones, weird paranormal lights, or is it just visitors? I think it's alien tourists who heard what a great time a weekend in Tijuana is and want to check it out. Could you imagine if aliens do come to earth, but they're not really interested in like diplomatic relations or starting a war or anything. They're just like, we heard you guys party hard and we want in on that. Number two, Michigan and Grand Park. Another very weird sighting coming from Reddit. This one was posted not even two days ago by a Redditor with a very funny username I can't read out loud on YouTube, but just know it was very funny. At first, it kind of looks like a piece of litter that somehow managed to get all the way up in the sky and is fluttering and darting all around. But if you take a closer look at it, it really seems like it's moving like it's being controlled. People in the comments of the subreddit quickly pointed out that a similar object to this showed up in Australia when this one's filmed in Michigan. Isn't that odd? Two of these similar reports happening on almost opposite ends of the world. People in the subreddit theorize that this object in the video is one of the ones that was shot down over Lake Huron, which definitely makes sense. Lake Huron is, you know, in Michigan. Could this be some of the last footage of this alien craft before it got burnt up? From this clip, I would say to me personally, it looks like some sort of hyper advanced drone, maybe more than a piloted craft. It looks very small, so unless there's like a really teeny tiny little alien inside there, I don't know. But with all cell phone footage, you know, it's kind of impossible to ascertain the size of the thing. I think this one's pretty conclusive, personally. And if this really is footage of the object that was shot down over Lake Huron, I would say the United States and Canadian governments agree with my assessment as well. But as all of these clips, please let me know what you think it is. If it's a drone or an alien or maybe just a really impressive kite that accidentally got destroyed. Number one, the Columbia sighting. Now our number one sighting is another international one. Hey, you think aliens are only going to show up around North America? Come on, expand your worldview a bit. If aliens invade, they're going to go after the whole planet. There's a whole lot to see, a whole lot of things they could burn down with lasers. And it seems like they were curious about the countryside of Colombia because this footage out of Bogota go to Colombia is truly out of this world. Seriously, this is like the most impressive UFO footage I've ever seen in my life. It was captured by a pro photographer who sent it along to a friend of his who's a YouTuber. Hey, reach out, let's collab. In the hopes of getting it to more eyes and people who can analyze it. And yeah, seriously, this is one of the most convincing things I've ever seen. Take a look. Now, I don't want to, you know, poke the bear too much. I know this sounds kind of annoying. I am almost of the belief that this footage is simply too good. I wouldn't outright throw it away and discard it, but I can't remember the last time I've ever seen UFO footage where the craft in this question is this clear and easy to make out. You can almost like make out sci-fi parts of it. You know, it looks to me like it wouldn't look too out of place in a cool video game, like a, like a Halo or something. If anyone's a Metroid fan, it reminds me a lot of like the ship that Samus flies around in. I'm just excited because they put Metroid Prime back out there. I think this race is kind 
kind of an interesting question and sort of a little like food for thought for debate. As camera quality improves and the average person is now at all times carrying with them a camera that rivals most professional quality, no doubt we're gonna start seeing more stuff like this. There's gonna be an influx of footage that starts to look much clearer, which then ironically ends up getting dismissed because it just looks too good and we assume it's been fake. We're used to blurry blobs shooting across the sky and I think that's what we kind of think UFOs look like. It's a bit of a weird horseshoe where you kind of want alien footage to look bad so it's more believable. I don't know, maybe I'm just rambling. In fifth place, we have the Hudson Valley UFO wave. So between 1982 and 1986, around 5,000 eyewitnesses reported seeing V-shaped UFOs with multicolored lights flying near the Hudson Valley, just about an hour north of New York City. So the first sighting was made on New Year's Eve of 1982 by a retired police officer in Kent, New York, who originally thought that he was observing an airplane. And hey, it's New Year's Eve. Make it that what you will. When the craft passed above his home, he realized that it was moving far too slowly and quietly to actually be a plane. So while most of the eyewitnesses described a slow-moving V-shaped UFO, other reports said the object appeared to be circular and capable of moving at fantastic speeds or disappearing altogether. Dennis Sant, a husband and father of five who had worked in local government for 17 years, described it as a very large object made of very dark gray, metallic, and uh, made no noise. The lights were iridescent, bright, and stood out in the sky, and they were three-dimensional. It looked like a city of lights that hung in the sky. So Dennis and his family followed them until he was consumed by what he described as a feeling of fright. A few miles away, traffic screeched to a halt on Interstate 84 as a mysterious object hovered overhead. A police cruiser stopped in the middle of the road to uh, radio in about this UFO. Ed Burns, a computer engineer and senior manager for IBM, was driving home on the Taconic Parkway and claimed that his radio was suddenly consumed by static. And when he leaned over to, you know, adjust the dial, he saw the um, triangular ship. He said that the back had to be as large as a football field, and once again, there was no noise. On that same night, eyewitness reports indicated that the object was slowly moving north over the Hudson River Valley. 13 others saw it in Newcastle, and about 10 minutes later, Ed Burns and at least 20 motorists saw it near Millwood. 10 minutes after that, the phones began ringing off the hook in the police station at Yorktown, and uh, didn't stop for hours. During another sighting, the UFO hovered about 30 feet above the Indian Point nuclear plant. The security supervisor was considering, you know, kabooming the craft down before it disappeared from sight. A home video showing a light formation above Brewster, New York was taken on June 10th of 1984 by local resident Bob Pizzuli. The footage has since been looked at by a number of photographic experts who indicate that the movement of the object on the video seems to be one rigid object and not individual objects. Now, despite eyewitness reports and photographic evidence, the phenomenon was never properly explained. In fourth place, we have Ross. Okay, look, whether you like it or not, Roswell is forever going to be associated with aliens and UFOs, and there's just so much that I wasn't going to leave it off the list. So former CIA agent Oscar Wayne Wolf claims he saw both living aliens, retrieved parts, and remains of alien ships throughout his career. So he made these claims about Area 51, claiming he caught a glimpse of an extraterrestrial spacecraft and a living alien. So once again, he saw a UFO. The 77-year-old man was speaking to UFO researcher Richard Dolan, but concerned about giving up his true identity at the time, went by the unknown. Anonymous. After he made his claim, it was then shared at the Citizens Hearing on Disclosure held at the National Press Club in Washington in 2013. So the agent is understood to have used a fake name throughout his career in the CIA, so the chances of his real name having been used in the account were never super high. He claims he worked for the CIA between 1957 and 1960, where he spent time in a military base in Southeast US where they analyzed physical evidence. Now in 2013, he thought he was about to pass away pretty soon, so he came forward for one more conversation. Yep, yeah, that one I mentioned a moment ago. He claimed that he was taken into Area 51 to look at items allegedly found and retrieved by the U.S. government. He claimed among them was, um, yep, a flying saucer that crashed and landed in July of 1947 in Roswell, New Mexico. Gee, where have we heard that before? He stated there were live aliens there and that he was taken to the S-4 facility. In his statement, he described seeing different saucer crafts in the facility, with the first place he visited holding the Roswell craft. And it was, you know, kind of crashed up, but apparently every alien that was in it died except for a few. And uh, it was really strange because it looked like really heavy aluminum foil. And hey, that matches up with every other description we've had. He claims he viewed the autopsy film, where the colonel on screen said, uh, uh, what we've got here is a great alien that we're interviewing. This man had no idea he was going to see this film, and he claims that the alien didn't like look human as far as the skin tone and the overall shape of it and uh, the size of its head compared with a normal human. Oh, and after all this, he was obviously warned by the CNA to uh, zip it. Look, we can all admit, something landed in Roswell. Ergo, a UFO did land there. Look, did I claim it was definitely an alien craft? I didn't claim that. Somebody else did. But like, look, it's definitely something of unknown origin. 
Ergo, UFO. In third place, we have the Go Faster video. So this video uploaded by the UFO investigative group to the STARS Academy of Arts and Sciences in March of 2018 was secured by a Freedom of Information Act request to the US government. So this video was taken in 2015 just off the east coast by an FA-18F fighter jet. You try saying that five times fast using the aircraft's onboard Raytheon AN-ASQ-228 Advanced Targeting Forward Looking Infrared Pod, also known as ATFLIR. I'll pretend I know what a lot of that means scientifically speaking, but a lot of big plain words. I know myself too well, I'll trip over my tongue if I try saying that more than once, so we're just going to call it uh, ATF. So ATF is designed to allow pilots to track, target, and destroy targets on the ground at ranges of up to 40 miles. It should be noted though that it's good at spotting, but not like engaging aerial targets. Alright, the video. So it's been nicknamed Go Fast by To The Stars, and it starts by explaining the various numbers and symbols that appear in the footage. Stuff like, you know, the aircraft's altitude, which was around 25,000 feet, and the fact that the ATF was pointed ahead and to the left of the Super Hornet. The reader also explains that the aircraft was traveling at 252 knots and in a 5 degree turn, and the unknown object was approximately 4.4 nautical miles away. The video shows the Super Hornet's weapon system operator repeatedly trying to acquire the UFO with the ATF's built in auto tracker, which apparently can pick out an object and keep it centered on camera. After two tries, the weapon system officer, or WSO, shouts, Whoa, got it! To which another person, assumed to be the pilot, says, Woohoo, whoa! What the bleep is that thing? The pilot asks. The WSO later says, Oh my gosh, dude. To which the pilot replies, Whoa, what is that, man? Now I know, this is where you skeptics start asking, But Alexa, how is this unknown object different from weird government aircrafts we don't know about? Well, alright. Allow me to explain, skeptics, since that's the whole point of this. For starters, the UFO does not have any kind of hot exhaust trail that would be emitted by a conventional turbine engine, so uh, it doesn't really emit any heat on the sensor. And uh, secondly, it doesn't have any visible wings or fins. So through my research, I've learned that even cruise missiles, such as the American Tomahawk or Russian Caliber, have uh, small winglets that should be visible. And other missiles, such as the Maverick anti-task missile, still have uh, stubby little fins. This UFO appears oval-like and does not appear to fly from nose first in the direction of any kind of travel. So once again, this was a video hidden and released by the government. Hello, side eye. In second place, we have the Wisdom UFO. So time to travel back to two days before my mom was born, so around 11 a.m. on April 6th of 1966, when an unexplained flying object flew around Westall High School in Melbourne, Australia. So Mr. Greenwood was teaching his year nine science class when a girl ran into the classroom, showing that there were flying saucers hovering over the football fields. The teacher and his students rushed outside, where they joined around 500 students, teachers, and locals. What he saw was an unidentified aerial craft. That was the shape one would see if you had, you know, like a saucer, slightly tipped on its side so that you saw the middle section as thicker than the ends. According to him, it performed several different actions, including hovering at different times, able to accelerate and disappear out of sight before reappearing uh, somewhere else. He said the craft was hovering 50 meters above the crowd, about 1 to 200 meters away, and clearly visible. More than 200 students and several teachers watched the UFO as it descended into a nearby field. Eyewitnesses watched the craft hovering around the school for approximately 20 minutes, and uh, yeah, described it as being a gray saucer shaped object that was about twice the size of a family car. Oh, and um, the Air Force reported that they were not in the airspace at the time of the incident. Just saying. In first place, we have the Cash Landrum incident. So on December 29th of 1980, Betty Cash, Vicky Landrum, and Colby Landrum were driving home from a night out when they saw 23 unidentified helicopters surrounding a huge diamond shaped object that was hovering above the trees. So this all started around 9 p.m. while they were driving on an isolated two lane road in dense woods and saw a light above some trees. But, you know, originally dismissed it as an airplane approaching Houston Intercontinental Airport. Hey, as someone who used to live near Pearson Airport, trust me, you learn to ignore planes. A few minutes later, they saw what they believed to be the same light as before, but now it was uh, closer and brighter. It said that it came from a huge diamond shaped object, which hovered at about treetop level, and that its base was expelling and that its base was expelling flame and emitting significant heat. So Vicky told Betty to stop the car, fearing they would be burned if they got closer, and both ladies originally got out of the car to examine the object, but Colby was terrified. So Vicky returned to the car to comfort him. While Betty stayed outside and was mesmerized by the bizarre sight. The object has been described as intensely bright and a dull metallic silver, once again shaped like a huge upright diamond, about the size of a water tower, with its top and bottom cut off so that they were flat rather than pointed. Small blue lights ringed the center, and periodically over the next few minutes, flames shot out of the bottom, flaring outward to create the effect of a large cone. So picture that. Every time the fire dissipated though, the UFO floated a few feet more down the road. But when the flames blasted out again, the object 
kept moving. So Betty said she had to use her coat to protect her hand from being burned by the door handle when she finally got back into the car. When she touched the dashboard, Vicky claimed her hand pressed into the softened vinyl, leaving an imprint that was evident weeks later. Investigators did cite it as proof of their account, but sadly the photos have not made their way to the internet. The group said that the object then ascended over the treetops and rose higher in the sky and that a group of helicopters approached it, surrounding it in tight formation. Like I mentioned before, the ladies counted 23 helicopters and later identified some of them as ones used by military forces worldwide. With the road now clear, Betty says she drove on, claiming to see glimpses of the object and the helicopters receding into the distance. And um, they said it lasted about 20 minutes. A Dayton police officer, Detective Lamar Walker, and his wife also claimed to have seen helicopters near the same area. The witnesses claimed that after the UFO and helicopters left, Betty took the other two home and then, you know, went to bed for the evening. But that night, they reportedly all experienced similar symptoms, although Betty to a much greater degree. Uh, they claimed that they suffered from nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, generalized weakness, and a burning sensation in their eyes. Also, like, really bad sunburn, which, ouch. Betty developed painful blisters on her skin, lost clumps of hair, and was unable to walk. She was released from a local hospital after 12 days, although her condition wasn't super better, and she later returned to the hospital for another 15 days. The Landrum's health was somewhat better, although they did suffer from that lingering weakness, skin sores, and hair loss. The duo of ladies sued the U.S. government for $20 million, and testimony of officials from NASA, the Air Force, and the Army, and Navy were given. But on August 21st of 1986, a U.S. District Court judge dismissed their case, noting that they hadn't really proved that the helicopters were associated with the U.S. federal government and that military officials had testified that uh, the U.S. armed forces didn't really have a large diamond-shaped aircraft in their possession. And uh, seeing as no government agency whatsoever possessed an aircraft resembling this UFO, the case was dismissed. Well then, thanks for proving that this craft, whatever the heck it was, wasn't of earthly origin. And that brings us to the end of today's installment, and if I missed anything egregious, I'd recommend checking out part one before, you know, letting me know down in the comments. I swear, every time I talk about UFOs, I learn something new. Heck, just today I learned that former US President Barack Obama confirmed that the government has footage of things they don't understand that they aren't releasing anytime soon, even though I wish they would. In fifth place, we have the lights above the New Jersey Turnpike. On July 14th of 2001, drivers on the New Jersey Turnpike stopped on the highway just 15 minutes after midnight, where they marveled at the sight of strange orange and yellow lights in a V formation over the Arthur Kill Waterway between Staten Island New York and Carteret, New Jersey. Carteret Police Department's Lieutenant Daniel Turant was one of the witnesses, as well as other metro area residents from the Throgs Neck Bridge on Long Island and Fort Lee, New Jersey, near the George Washington Bridge. Air traffic controllers initially denied that any airplanes, military jets, or space flights could have caused the mysterious lights. A national weather meteorologist could find nothing in the weather to also explain those lights. Luckily, when there's something strange in one's neighborhood, one can always call New York Strange Phenomena Investigators or NYSPI. No, 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 no Ghostbusters here. This band of inquisitive minds claim to have discovered the FAA radar report from Newark International Airport on the night in question that indicates an enormous number of airborne objects without transponders beginning at around 10.31 p.m. and ending at 12.51 a.m. EST. At least 15 people contacted the police department to report the strange lights, but Durant and other police officers are at a loss to explain just what it was hovering in their skies. Here's the thing, it's been 22 years since that incident now, and if there weren't any military folks in the air and so many witnesses saw this, I'm leaning towards an other on this. In fourth place, we have the Alderney UFO sighting. On April 23rd of 2007, Ray Bauer, a 50-year-old pilot with 18 years flying experience, reported seeing a cigar-shaped brilliant white light in the sky. Now, he first thought that it was reflected light from greenhouses on the nearby island of Guernsey before realizing it was a stationary object, approximately the size of a Boeing 737, at an altitude of around 2,000 feet and at a distance of roughly 40 miles. Bauer said that he approached the light and looked at it through his binoculars. He also said he saw a second object moving in formation with the first set of light, later stating it was around closer to the island of Gorenzny. He said the UFO was clearly visual for approximately nine minutes. After landing in Alderney, Bauer made an official report to the Civil Aviation Authority, labeling the incident as a near miss. He then flew the return leg of his flight to Southampton, but did not see the objects again. By the 25th of April of 2007, the British Ministry of Defense had stated that it would not investigate the reported sighting. Approximately a week after that sighting, the MOD stated the incident had taken place in French airspace, and so it was outside their responsibility. Two weeks after that, the MOD 
released information connected with the report, including a statement from a second pilot. The report of the sighting published by the MOD reads in its entirety. First object was bright orange yellow, there was a gap in light or darker area. Second object was identical. Several passengers on his aircraft had noticed the light, one of whom described it as sunlight colored. In 2021, he said it was a very sharply defined, solid, bright yellow gold object with a couple of black bands on the side that were kind of shimmering. Two passengers reported seeing the light to the Evening Standard, one of them describing it as an orange light, kind of like an elongated oval. Patrick Patterson, a pilot from the Channel Islands airline Blue Island, reported that he saw a similarly described object in the same approximate position. It was later reported that this pilot saw an object behind him to his left at around 1950 feet. One interpretation of this event was that this was an atmospheric phenomenon. Despite the pilot's openness about the incident, the cooperation of the military, and countless eyewitness reports from passengers and people on the ground, the incident remains a total mystery. I'm just saying, there are too many witnesses for this to be anything fake. In third place, we have the Belgian UFO wave. So the Belgian UFO wave began in November of 1989 and peaked with the events of the night of the 30th to the 31st of March 1990. On that night, one unknown object was tracked on radar, and two Belgian Air Force F-16s were Sent to investigate, with neither pilot reporting seeing the object. No reports were received from the public on the date, but over the next two weeks, reports from 143 people who claimed to have witnessed the object were received, all of them after the event. Over the ensuing months, many others claimed to have witnessed these events as well. Following the incident, the Belgian Air Force released a report detailing the events of that night. Yeah, yeah, I'll backtrack, I promise. At around 11 o'clock at night on the 30th of March, the supervisor for the Control Reporting Center, or CRC, at Glans received reports that three unusual lights were seen moving towards Thorombe Jean Bleu, which lies to the southeast of Brussels. Glan CRC requested that the Waver Gendarmerie send a patrol to confirm the sightings. Approximately 10 minutes later, some reports stated that a second set of lights were seen moving towards the first triangle. Traffic Center Control tracked one object only on its radar, and an order to scramble two F-16 fighters from Beauvais Air Base was given. Through this time, in reports after the event, some people claimed that the phenomenon was visible from the ground, describing the whole formation as maintaining their relative positions while moving slowly across the sky. And over the next hour, the two scrambled F-16s attempted nine separate interceptions of the target. On three occasions, they managed to obtain a radar lock for a few seconds, but these were later shown to be radar locks on each other. After around 12.30 in the morning, radar our contact became much more sporadic, and the final confirmed lock took place at around 40 minutes after midnight. Following several further unconfirmed contacts, the F-16s eventually returned to the base shortly after 1 a.m. Members of the Weber Gendarmerie, who had been sent to confirm the original report, described four lights now being arranged in a square formation, all making short, jerky movements before gradually losing their luminosity and disappearing in four separate directions at around 1.30. During one of the radar locks, the UFO accelerated from 150 miles per hour to over 1,100 miles per hour, while changing altitude from 9,000 feet to 5,000 feet in a matter of seconds. After his retirement, Major General Wolf de Bruy wrote in a statement that the Belgian UFO wave was exceptional and the Air Force could not identify the nature, origin, and intentions of the reported phenomena. The Belgian objects have still never been explained. Look, Air Force folks are the ones to trust in situations like this. They are literally trained on how to recognize aircrafts in the sky. In second place, we have a sighting in Alaska. Japan Airlines Cargo Flight 1628 was a UFO incident that occurred on November 17th of 1986, involving a Japanese Boeing 747-200F cargo aircraft. I'm learning a lot about planes today. <laughs> the aircraft was en route from Paris to Narita International Airport, near Tokyo, with a cargo of Beaujolais wine. Mm. Wine. Focus, Alexa, focus. <laughs> Over the Reykjavik to Anchorage section of the flight at around 1711, so. 511 over eastern Alaska, the crew first witnessed two unidentified objects to their left. These abruptly rose from below and closed in to escort the aircraft. Each had two rectangular arrays of what appeared to be glowing nozzles or thrusters, though their bodies remained obscured by darkness. When closest, the aircraft's cabin was lit up and the captain could feel their heat on his face. These two crafts departed before a third, much larger disc-shaped object started trailing them. Anchorage Air Traffic Control requested an oncoming United Airlines flight to confirm the unidentified traffic, but when it and a military craft sighted plane 1628 at around 10 to 6, no other craft could be distinguished. Captain Tarochi contacted Anchorage Air Traffic Control and requested, you know, a change of course. The UFO followed the plane despite any of the captain's maneuvers. The sighting lasted 50 minutes and ended in the vicinity of Denali. All of the data, including ground radar that captured the unidentified craft, was collected and presented at a meeting with the FBI and the CIA. After reviewing all the material, the government officials decided that this was the first radar recording of a UFO. Yep, I didn't stutter. The government confirmed this. In first place, we have the Shaykh 
Harbor UFO incident. So this incident was the reported impact of an unknown large object into waters near Shag Harbor, Nova Scotia, you know, a tiny fishing village on the Atlantic coast, on October 4th of 1967. The reports were investigated by the RCMP, Canadian Coast Guard, the Navy, and the Air Force, as well as the U.S. Condom Committee. I had to research that because I first thought it was like a typo for condom, and I almost busted out laughing. Alrighty. Time for facts. At about 11.20 p.m. Atlantic Daylight Time, at least, you know, 11 people saw a low flying lit object heading towards the harbor. Multiple witnesses reported hearing a whistling sound, like, you know, a large kaboom device, and then a whoosh, and then finally a loud bang. While en route to Toronto, while flying over Sherbrooke and St. John, Quebec, at around 3,658 meters from the Halifax International Airport, Air Canada officer Robert Ralph pointed out to Captain Pierre Charbonneau on flight 305 that there was, um, something strange out the left side of the aircraft at 7.15 p.m. In his report, the captain reported an object tracking along on a parallel course a few miles away. He described it as a brilliantly lit, rectangular object with a string of smaller lights trailing it. At 7.19 p.m., the pilots noticed a sizable silent explosion near the large object. And two minutes later, a second explosion occurred which faded to a blue cloud around the object. Meanwhile, while standing at the wheelhouse of his vessel, Captain Leo Howard Mercy was looking at four blips on his decorator that were stationary. He looked up at about 28 kilometers from the vessel's windows, he could see the four bright objects situated in a roughly rectangular formation. The entire crew of nearly 20 fishermen stood on deck and watched the object in the northeastern sky. Mercy radioed the Rescue Coordination Center and the Harbor Master in Halifax asking for an explanation and filed a report with the Lunenburg RCMP outlining his sighting when they returned to port. Over in Halifax, the Chronicle Herald and local radio stations reported a glowing object that was seen by many people who called their newsroom. They reported witnessing strange glowing objects flying around Halifax at around 10 p.m. Assuming an aircraft had crashed, within about 15 minutes, two RCMP officers arrived at the scene. Concerned for survivors, the RCMP detachment contacted the Rescue Coordination Center in Halifax to advise them of the situation and ask if any aircrafts were missing. Before any attempt at rescue could be made, the flying object, with the lights still showing, started to sink and disappeared from view. So a rescue mission was quickly assembled. Within half an hour of the crash, local fishing boats went out to the crash site in the waters of the Gulf of Maine off Shag Harbor to look for survivors. Here's the fun part. No survivors, bodies, or debris were taken, either by the fishermen or by a Canadian Coast Guard search and rescue cutter, which arrived about an hour later from nearby Clark's Harbor. By the next morning, RCC Halifax had determined that no aircrafts were missing. While still tasked with the search, the captain of the Canadian Coast Guard cutter received a radio message from RCC Halifax that all commercial, private, and military aircraft were accounted for along the eastern seaboard in both Atlantic provinces and New England. That same morning, RCC Halifax also sent a priority telex to the air desk at Air Force headquarters in Ottawa, which handled all civilian and military UFO sightings, informing them of the crash and that all conventional explanations such as aircraft, flares, had been dismissed. The object was never officially identified and was therefore referred to as an unidentified flying object in the Government of Canada document. Yep, that was the name. I'm just going to repeat this. The Government of Canada officially confirmed it as a UFO. Two days after the incident had been observed, a detachment of Navy divers from Fleet Diving Unit Atlantic was assembled, and for the next three days, they combed the seafloor of the Gulf of Maine off Shag Harbor looking for an object. The final report said no trace of an object was found, just saying, Fascinating that no one found anything, and that the government confirmed it was a UFO. So take that, skeptics. Number five, falling from the sky. Coming up first today is going to be this wild footage that was posted to TikTok quite recently. It might have flown under the radar, but now it's blowing up. And if you're into the supernatural and the unexplained, maybe you've seen it on your front page already in between videos of cats falling over. It was posted by user PMESASSO, PMESASASO, and it showcases a truly bizarre encounter and possibly a close encounter of the first kind. In this video, we can see something falling from the sky. Now, it's difficult to make out entirely what it is, but it looks more technological than not. It's not a bird. Looks a bit like it's a falling craft or a drone of some kind that's been shot down. Do you remember that week or two in February where every day a mysterious unknown craft would get shot down and then the government would refuse to explain or comment on what would happen? Remember how that happened and now we've all just moved on from it? I'm still thinking about it. Anyway, after that craft seemingly descends to the ground below, we see in the sky that a bunch of military fighter jets seem to be in hot pursuit of it, which definitely makes me pretty suspicious if there's fighter jets not even a minute behind a strange, unidentified craft. Now, there are some doubters in the comments who aren't as convinced. Some say the crafts are therefore an air show and the thing falling from the sky part of it as well. 
Of course, did they consider maybe the aliens were the one putting on an air show? And the government didn't want to be upstaged, and that's why they sent a craft over. If I know anything about the US military, it's that they don't like being second best at anything. And if you want to watch a place that's the number one best at something, it's top five scary, and it's scary videos we've got. If you can think it up, we've got a video or two on it. I mean it. Megalodons, ghosts, ghouls, goblins, aliens, conspiracy theories, horror movies, basically anything freaky under the sun or above it, we got two or three videos on. So hit subscribe, make sure you hit that little bell so you don't miss a single thing, but if you'd be so kind, do that at the end of this video, because I got four more mysterious orbs and UFOs coming up for you right now. Number four, Arizona's mysterious orb. Coming up next today on our list of strange sightings in the sky is this mysterious footage of an orb-like sphere bouncing around through the clouds. This clip was uploaded and posted to the UFO subreddit a few days ago where it blew up almost immediately. Posted by user Amvion and shout out UFO subreddit, making my job so much easier every day. The clip is a snippet from a local news station in Arizona reporting on a series of wildfires, wildfires, reporting on a series of wildfires in San Bernardino, California. When the camera catches something a little hotter, that was a pun, if you see what I did there. You can see a strange little orb floating around high above the forests. Now, it's very difficult to tell from here, but it looks to be moving at an incredibly fast speed, with seemingly no method of propulsion or exhaust trails to be found. It can even be going through the smoke at one point during the video, which would be catastrophic for most aerial crafts, as this area would be far, far too hot to approach via helicopter. Now, a user in the comments added a little bit of additional insight too. It looks very far out from where anyone one could be piloting a drone. Looks to be a few miles out in the brush. Any civilian would be heavily discouraged if not outright prohibited from flying a drone near a wildfire area with a possible crash with a helicopter being disastrous. So it has to be something that wasn't supposed to be in that airspace or maybe doesn't even know where it is. So it's hard to tell what's going on with this one. I'm not sure what any skeptical answers or rational answers could be beyond the usual catch-all of strange drone or weather balloon. The object doesn't move too erratically or non-humanly, so it doesn't seem like it itself is making the decisions. I'm really not sure what this could be, my friends, which means you know what time it is. You let me know down below what you think it might be. Or just tell me something nice about your day. You know, I don't know, something that made you smile today. Number three, something from the sky. Coming up next today at our number three spot is going to be this short, sweet, mysterious clip posted to us on the most reputable source of information on the internet, TikTok, by a user going by the name of Brian Daniel. Gosh, people have the weirdest names on the internet these days. Brian Daniel, what does that even mean? In this short clip, Daniel claims that near his home, something fell from the sky onto the ground below, glowing a searing bright blue, ethereally brighter than anything he'd seen before. Commenters said they'd seen the same thing in Florida where the uploader lived. News reported that it was a meteor, but Daniel claims that it goes much deeper than that. He claims that the next day he tracked the crash site of the meteor and discovered what seemed to be a government operation cleaning the possible crash site, filming some feds standing around with their thumbs in their pockets on the beach. From there, Daniel claims that a mysterious man in a suit was on his front lawn filming his house and him when he got home and he didn't look like he was from the housing authority. Eerie. For what purpose? We don't know. Now, as fantastical as this video is, I'm always more than a little weary to believe something from TikTok, just because the app is very, very easy for anyone to edit content with, and this video is literally three disconnected shots clipped together. I know I'm a man on the internet telling you to believe things, but I think you should always be incredibly rational and skeptical and take everything with a grain of salt, and there's nothing to suggest that these three things were even taken by the same camera. Now, the meteor in Florida is real. That happened on April 13th, 2021, so jot that down, that did happen. But the thing that's really holding me back about this clip and the reason I find it more skeptical than I believe it is because the mysterious agent at the end of the video is wearing a suit that doesn't quite fit him. I thought they were the men in black, not the men in the dress for less at Ross's summer collection. 
bitch didn't know I could go there. Number two, what's on the moon? And coming in next today is going to be this incredibly weird clip posted to TikTok recently by a user going by the name of Larry Lou. Now, this is one of the stranger supernatural UFO clips I've seen in a few minutes. You'll see why in a few seconds. You'll definitely want to see this. In this strange clip, we can see something filming something bizarre that seems to be orbiting the moon. We can see some unknown objects flying around our moon getting a little too close for comfort. That's our moon. Is that our own technology? Are these man-made satellites or are these scouts, drones, or something else not of this world? Now before we really put our tinfoil hats on and get wild with the speculating, we need to talk about the zoom in and the quality on this camera. I am inclined to believe that this guy works for NASA because he seems to have the James Webb telescope in his back pocket. I have watched innumerable countless, countless UFO clips for work, and I have literally never seen a clip this high quality. I was salivating watching this. I can't even talk about the alien stuff because I'm too busy focusing on the pixels in this thing. You can make out the, the footprints on the surface of the moon. You can see Neil Armstrong size 13 on the dust. You're telling me this guy shot this on his phone? Why is this man not filming every single supernatural occurrence on this planet? If we set this guy up in the woods, we would have Bigfoot, Mothman, the Loch Ness, all that proven, disproven within an afternoon. I need to take five. I need, I need a drink. Okay. Okay. I'm good. I'm good. Back to the original video. Most people in the comments were like me, solely focusing on the incredible lens on this user's iPhone. A few people suggested that that could be the American flag from the surface of the moon. I find that a bit unlikely, but I don't know enough about moons to disprove that. So what could it be? Let me know down below in the comments, or hey, feel free to just continue to comment on how impressive the camera zoom is. What What is he working with there? What am I working with? I don't know. Number one, crop circles. I, I didn't need to say it like that. Coming up last on our list of UFO sightings we just can't wrap our noggins around is this footage that was taken in 1989. Now, I know the title says 2023, but if you really squint 1989, 2023, I don't know, they look exactly the same to me. It might be a vintage, but that just means the high strangeness has been aged to perfection. Don't dismiss it till you get your eyes on it. It looks like an excerpt of a documentary about aliens and UFOs of some kind sort of like what you're watching now, but bet the guy hosting this isn't even half as charming. In the video, clear as day, we can see two strange, small, metallic spheres racing around a farmstead, glowing bright against the shroud of the night sky. They seem diligently at work, creating an intricate pattern below in the fields. Some sort of circle in the crop, uh, an almost crop circle, if you will. I feel like crop circles kind of fell out of vogue in alien culture, which is a shame. I think they're very cool and fun. They always make me think of the underrated M. Night picture, Signs. I know some people hate that movie, but I thought otherwise. Anyway, I guess our parents were much more frightened by flattened designs and bits of the grain and cereal, and we just don't feel the same way. But I, for one, want to bring it back. I want to bring crop circle culture back. Now this clip is pretty remarkable. Some say it almost looks too good and there's been a raging debate in the UFO and alien community as to whether or not this was a real clip or a very well engineered hoax for darn near 30 years now. Detractors argue that it's CGI while believers state that the CGI would be too advanced for the time. I mean most CGI around this era look like reboot, you know? Not to besmirch reboot, but come on. Well, we probably won't find the answer today to whether or not it's a hoax or not because only you can truly decide that, okay? The truth is out there for you. Just like only you can decide if M. Night Shyamalan is a misunderstood auteur or a total hack. We're just not going to talk about the Avatar movies. Number five, the USS Omaha. Coming up first today on our list of unexplained UFO sightings on camera is going to be this wild footage taken off the coast of San Diego from onboard the Navy ship USS Omaha. The video footage was shot on an FLIR camera, which is an incredibly expensive, fancy bit of tech. It's a thermal camera to detect heat. It's perfect for this sort of thing. And if you want one for yourself, civilians can buy these cameras. They cost $300,000. That's about one month's rent in Toronto. Very fair. In the footage, we can see what looks to be a sphere-like object flying over the ship before entering the water. The Omaha claimed that for days before this incident was recorded, they were seeing drone-like objects flying around their ship 
that the crew had no knowledge of. This footage was taken from a crew member trying to ascertain what it was that they were dealing with. Now there is some audio on the clip and it's illuminating. When the object goes into the water, we hear the sailors say mark, bearing, and range, meaning that the sailors on the ship were making a note of the coordinates and location where it went in, suggesting that maybe a submarine was sent in to recover or discover whatever was going on in there. Did it even submerge in the water or does it seem a bit too like the craft outright disappears going into the water? I wish so bad we could get some more angles on this or a follow-up to be able to find out what this was. Until then, we just have this strange footage to go off of and what speculation we have at home. There's a wild conspiracy theory that I just found out recently and I love, and we'll mention it a few times in this video, about a secret UFO construction facility under the water. Maybe this drone was heading on home. Who knows? And if you're looking for way more conspiracy theories about really anything, aliens, Bigfoot, JFK, you name it, we got all of that and then some on Top 5 Scary. We really have a video on just about anything and everything you can think of that's freaky and eeky. So hit subscribe, make sure you hit that little bell so you don't miss a scream, but if you wouldn't mind, do that at the end of this video because I got four more stories of UFO sightings coming up for you right now. Whew, number four. Our next clip comes to us from the UFO subreddit, and it was posted by user the Firo saying, this video was taken by a good friend of mine on a flight to El Paso, and as soon as it gets noticed, it's gone. In the video, we can see we're in the passenger seat of a jet high above the ground, and flying around the windows is an unexplained object zipping around at high speeds. Saucer-like object, looking a bit like maybe it was a frisbee that got tossed into the air by Godzilla. Now, it does definitely look like a classic flying saucer, like what you imagine a UFO to be, but not as many people were convinced. More than a few people in the comments section for this one were a little skeptical of this high-flying footage. Several commenters suggested that this flying saucer is actually little more than a reflection of something from inside the plane's cabin, suggesting that if you pause enough and look right in the video, you can see the object's reflection being repeated in the window pane. Now, there are just as many people suggesting that it is a solid object existing outside the plane. The trouble is we've been given very limited footage and it's hard to tell and there was no follow-up by the original poster to provide any more details, so we only have this little excerpt that we've been given. Whenever there's a scenario like this, I do like to leave it up to you, my faithful YouTube comment audience. What do you think? Is this a flying saucer soaring above the clouds or just a reflection of some light? I could honestly go either way with this one. I will say it could easily be explainable as a reflection, but I also feel like the object has a certain weight to it. I don't know. I'm, I'm directly in the middle for this one. I'm a centrist on this video. It should have been the number three point, but it wasn't. Anyway, jury's out. Please let me know what you think of this. Let's move on to number three. Number three, New Delhi. Coming up next is going to be this clip shared online with the caption, a weird set of lights above New Delhi. Take a look-see. So in the clip, pretty clearly we can see, yeah, there's some strange lights going on in the night sky above New Delhi. There's a scattering of lights above the city's horizon. Now, immediately your first thought might be that it's drones, which is a reasonable assumption when it comes to UFO stuff. I feel like several videos that come out of little glowing lights dashing across the night sky usually end up being civilian drones. However, the original poster clarified that drones are illegal in India and there aren't widespread at all for civilians. And on top of that, the area that's being filmed is said to be in the slums where it's incredibly unlikely that anyone would have access to drones. The poster added this little bit of context with the video. I I saw this today around 8 p.m. in New Delhi with a friend. It was massive. This cannot be a building as there is no tall building in that direction, only slums with heights of about four to five floors. Yet this building looked as tall as the Burj Khalifa. There was a moderate wind going on and I thought if it's drones, why aren't they swaying? Not to forget, drones are illegal in India and especially in New Delhi. It looked massive in the sky. I wish the camera saw what my eyes could see. It could absolutely blew me Away. I've been to drone shows, but this looked nothing like it. Any idea what this could be? Also, I agree. I wish our cameras did just capture exactly what our eyes saw. It would make all this UFO stuff 
so much, so much easier. And also I would finally get a nice picture of the moon to have on my phone. Now some people in the comment section on this clip suggested that maybe it was a laser light show, but that's just speculation and nothing concrete. Well, one particularly good suggestion from a commenter that did make me laugh said that the original poster should have ran towards the lights to see what happens and investigate up close and personal, you know? Worst case, yeah, you get abducted, never see your friends, family, or home planet again, but you also would get the ride of a lifetime, and if you do survive to come back home, you get an amazing story to tell people. So live a little. Number two, Garden Ridge. Our next offering for your entertainment, and I hope your amusement, is this short clip that was uploaded to YouTube pretty recently. UFO spotted over Garden Ridge, Texas. In this clip, we can see a somewhat strange flying object that looks a bit like a cocoon being propelled forward, or maybe even a beehive or something. The entity has no propulsion or trails behind it, which really doesn't explain how it's moving forward so fast. Some sort of anti-gravity manipulation technology that I don't understand. Is that too wild to speculate that an alien has that? Now we've seen cocoon-like UFOs a few times doing these videos, actually. We saw them a bunch. I don't know if you remember, one of them turned out to be Mr. Peanut, but most of them are UFOs. I'd say after triangle UFOs or little light clusters, I probably see videos of little cocoon-like UFOs like this more than any other kind. So what are these cocoon-like UFOs that keep appearing, and why do they all look so similar? And this lack of propulsion, too, is really puzzling me. Now, the original poster returned after the fact to add a little bit of clarity in the comments. He said the object was moving with the wind, not against it, so maybe it's possible it's something like a weather balloon that has been swept up in an air current. That's usually what most of these clips turn out to be. I would love to see a statistic on how many UFO sightings are actually weather balloons balloons because I suspect it's probably like 99%. Another commenter suggested that this could be an object heading towards Randolph Air Force Base, speculating that the UAP seen in this video could be a manned jetpack or a very tiny stealth craft of some kind, which would be pretty cool, or even some sort of new drone technology the US military is developing. Now, among other things though, the original uploader did admit and suggest that this really could just be a balloon suggested that he thought it might be attached to a floral arrangement that somebody let go of. Hey, maybe an alien was picking up a last minute Valentine's Day gift. Or hey, maybe an alien had to apologize to someone, you know? Maybe a probing went wrong and a little flowers was the only thing that could smooth it over. I wonder if they'll keep that in the video. <laughs> Number one, the A-10 over Arizona. And coming up at our final spot today for crazy UFO footage is going to be this dramatic footage of a spherical UAP being filmed hailing an A-10 aircraft over Arizona. The footage was filmed by a mobile scope truck recorded by the DHS, that's the Department of Homeland Security. The craft caught on camera is one of unknown origins, well, obviously. That's why it's a UFO. The U doesn't stand for usual, it's unidentified. Now there's really not a lot to go on from this clip, as the original uploader didn't provide a ton of insight or backstory beyond the short clip, so we're left with mostly speculation. Similar to the previous clip, I have to wonder maybe if this is a drone of some kind due to its size in comparison to the rest of the craft which dwarfs it. Could this be an unmanned craft? Is someone piloting it from a remote location far away? Now earlier in the video, I quickly shouted out a conspiracy which I recently discovered and I hope we can do like a full video on it because it was fascinating, saying that a a majority of the crafts that we see in UFO videos are scout crafts that come from a construction facility hidden somewhere deep beneath the ocean from a civilization that predates ours. This advanced technological facility is manned by an artificial intelligence that keeps it running autonomously and produces these small crafts naturally to scout out the planet and, well I don't know yet what they're doing, but something alien. Now obviously that is a very, very, very tinfoil hat theory. I got it from a less than reputable website, but it is a ton of fun to speculate on and would certainly make sense why there are so many sightings of these similar objects if they were all literally coming from the same factory line. And also, wouldn't that just be the nicest, I don't know, funniest little ironic cap to aliens if we were spending all our time looking up, but they've been below us the whole time? Anyway, something to think about. Number five, the Phoenix Lights. If you ask most people what the most famous UFO sighting in the world was, they might say the Roswell, New Mexico incident. It's definitely the most referenced 
referenced in pop culture. There's a CW TV show about it that's had like 10 seasons. Roswell is almost synonymous with the concept of flying saucers. But the most documented UFO sighting occurred in 1997 in Phoenix, Arizona, when a series of bright lights in the sky were seen together by hundreds of people. Okay, this isn't just some passing dot. This was something hundreds of people corroborated on. Now, like any good UFO sighting, there's no real concrete answer as to what happened, and only speculation to go on. So let's run through the facts. It was on March 13, 1997. Hundreds of people around Phoenix described seeing these vivid, bright lights around six or seven total. Now, reports claim that these mysterious lights were huge and big enough that they were blocking out your vision of the clouds, the stars, but they wouldn't produce any noise, like a jet or a helicopter or anything. Big, blocky, silent. A few hours later on that same night, a second wave of sightings came over the city, describing a long trail of blinking objects that some said was a mile long and boomerang shape. They were blinking in regular intervals, orange and blue lights. Air traffic controllers reported seeing these lights, but didn't detect any planes on the radar. And the air traffic controllers described this incident as inexplicable. But maybe the strangest part about all this, maybe just to me, is that the first person who called in the sighting was legend. 80s mullet owner and actor Kurt Russell who was flying into the city with his son. Snake Plissken asked what the strange lights hovering over the city was, leading to Kurt Russell calling it in. The only thing he got back from air traffic control was, we don't show anything. Now officially, the military would claim that this was a test for high intensity flares, but eyewitnesses weren't so convinced. The governor of Arizona at the time, who was a former Air Force officer, claimed that the aircraft he saw that day didn't resemble anything he had ever seen in his life. So, what happened in Arizona that day? Was it a widespread enough hoax, government cover-up, or proof of life from beyond the stars? You tell me. And if you're looking for more UFO videos, you already know we have got that and then some. Click on through to the channel, we've literally got hundreds of UFO videos. You could be watching them for the rest of the evening. But if UFO stuff ain't your jam, we've got cryptids, conspiracies, true crime, fake crime, pretty much anything you could want. So hit subscribe, hit that little bell, and don't miss a single thing. But do it at the end of this video, would you kindly? We got way more UFO sightings coming up for you. Number four, Japanese flight 1268. Our next sighting comes to us out of Japan. Well, the skies of Japan. It's a video about flying objects after all. It was in November of 1986 when a pilot on a cargo flight thought that he made a close encounter of the third kind. One Captain Kenju Tarauchi and a skeleton crew were flying a cargo delivery of some fancy bougie French wines into Japan when Captain Tarauchi claims he saw shining bright lights surrounding both wings of the plane. Now initially, Tarauchi said at the time he thought that this was just US flown fighter jets patrolling around the border of the Soviet Union. Union. But when he got a decent look at the craft, he realized these weren't friends of Uncle Sam. He said, two spaceships stopped in front of our face, shooting off bright lights. He continued saying, the inside of the cockpit shined brightly, and I felt warm in the face. These aircraft in particular were described as being cuboid, I guess they're Borg ships, with jet propulsion systems clustered around a dark center. At the same time that these unidentified objects were soaring by the plane, these objects seemed like they were jamming the plane's communications in some way, as Tarauchi and the crew couldn't contact ground control at all during the sighting, as if there was some electromagnetic field. The rest of the crew, however, wasn't quite as convinced by this strange encounter, with the co-pilot and flight engineer believing that the objects they saw were not but strange lights, and agreed that they were definitely unexplained and they couldn't find a reasonable possibility for what they were, but that they didn't necessarily think they were flying saucers. A committee looking into the phenomena claims that it was just light refraction through ice crystals suspended in the clouds. But that doesn't quite explain how the cockpit got warm or anything like that, or where the communications were going. So what do you think? Aliens or ice crystals? Number three, the Betty and Barney Hill incident. It's sad how many people see a UFO and no one else in the entire world will believe them. You know, not their friends, not their family. That's why this case is different. A young married couple claims that not only they saw a UFO together, but they were abducted together. That's one for the memory books. You know, they say the couple that probes together stays together. It's a fairly well-documented case. It even served as the inspiration behind the alien abduction story in American Horror Story Asylum. And how about Evan Peters, huh? Love that guy. Anyway, the real story revolved around 
around Barney and Betty Hill in 1961. The two of them were driving home through New Hampshire when they both saw a blinding bright light flying above them in the sky. Betty started to feel dizzy and the two of them soon found themselves asleep on the road. A moment passed and they found themselves parked in their driveway two full hours later, not remembering a second of what had happened. The couple claimed that they had traveled to a star system 39 light years away called Zeta Reticuli. The two had connections and were able to get in contact with Air Force officials to report their strange sighting and would spend the next few years trying to explain their case to anyone who would listen in the desperate hopes of getting some help and some answers. Barney would meet with a psychiatrist regularly who he told that he kept having nightmares where he was being operated on by small gray skinned slanted eyed creatures that would take samples of his skin, his fingernails, his flesh to do with he did not know. So the psychiatrist had him undergo hypnosis therapy. His wife as well, hoping perhaps that something repressed could be unearthed and maybe they should have left it alone because what they found was terrifying. When going under hypnosis and waking back up, Betty was able to draw a scientifically accurate map of the star system from memory, creating a map that was nearly spot on to the real Zeta Reticuli. This incident inspired the Air Force to launch Project Blue Book to collect more stories of UFO abductions like this. Number 2. Kenneth Arnold If you've ever wondered why flying saucers became the default term for UFOs as opposed to something like flying cigars or flying triangles, it has a very large part to do with this next story, which was one of the first big mainstream sightings of a UFO in 1947. Now interestingly, possibly coincidentally, possibly not, this incident occurred only a few weeks before the infamous Roswell, New Mexico incident. So UFO fever was just on the brain around 1947. This happened to Kenneth Arnold, a clean cut all American aviator. He was flying a small private plane over Washington around Mount Rainier on a scavenger hunt of sorts for the wreckage of a downed plane which had a fairly significant reward offered by the army for its salvage, which Kenneth was after of course. While he was prospecting, Arnold claims to have seen nine, brinding, nine blinding bright flashes of light flying in a bizarre pattern like the tail of a kite. Described as saucers moving at an incredible speed, Arnold tried to do his level best to assess what these things were from the seat of his aircraft, working out how fast they were moving, taking his watch and clocking from when they reached the peak of the mountain. He worked out that they were going about 1700 miles per hour, which is pretty darn fast considering in 1947 humans had just broken the sound barrier at 700 miles per hour and that was an unbelievable leap in technology. Whatever it was Kenneth saw, it was something far more advanced than anything he'd ever seen on Earth. When he'd landed, he told the crew at the airport about everything that he'd seen, suggesting that he'd seen missiles or maybe some experimental new tech. For weeks after, Arnold would become a media darling, being interviewed by several reporters all hoping to get the big scoop on this. Part of what made this such a defining UFO story for the American people was how earnest Arnold was about his story. He was an honest man who provided straightforward facts, experience with aviation, a mathematical and rational approach to all of this, and very little in the way of wild speculation. Which is a shame, because I love wild speculation. Let's do a little more wild speculating with our last point. Number one, the Betty Cash incident. In December 29, 1980, Betty Cash would see something on the outskirts of Houston near Dayton that would change the course of her life forever. She was driving with her friend, Vicki Landrum, and Landrum's grandson. At around 9 p.m., the three of them noticed a blinding bright light in the sky. Landrum believed it to be the second coming of Jesus, whereas Betty Cash described described it like this. We didn't know what it was, but we knew that it was something lighting up the sky. We all began to feel this heat, and all of a sudden Vicky screamed for me to stop. And when I stopped, she went forward, and her handprint was embedded into the dashboard of the car. And I thought, well, I've got to see what this is. So I got out, I walked towards the front of the car, and I stood there looking up to try and figure out what this object was, and then a diamond-shaped object appeared with flames shooting out. The heat was tremendous. When I reached for the door handle, it was so hot I couldn't even begin to open it. The only thing I was thinking while all this was happening was, are we gonna make it out of this alive? Landrum stated that moments later, 
a large squadron of black helicopters took over the sky above the area. After the choppers cleared, Betty took the Landrums home and retired for the night. The next morning, Miss Cash said she was extremely sick, suffering from nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, weakness, and intense burning in her eyes. Now, bizarrely, Landrum and her grandson all reported the same symptoms. These symptoms would worsen pretty seriously, with large blisters forming on the skin, and eventually Betty Cash had to be taken to a hospital where she was suffering from cancer symptoms, where she lost large patches of skin and clumps of hair. Now, to date, there has never been a conclusive answer to what happened to Cash and Landrum. What caused the radiation sickness? Starting off this list in our number five spot, we have Project Grudge Report 13. Okay, so I've read quite a few different UFO sighting stories and stories of alleged alien abductions, and this is fully one of the most terrifying that I have ever heard of. So basically, the story starts off in March of 1956 when Air Force Sergeant Jonathan P. Lovett was assisting Major William William <laughs> was assisting Major William Cunningham in the White Sands Missile Testing Grounds near Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. The pair were out searching for debris from a recent rocket test when Major Cunningham heard a loud scream. His first thought was that Sergeant Lovett had been bitten by a snake, so he went around to help aid his partner when he allegedly saw something he never expected. He recounted seeing the sergeant being dragged away by some sort of long serpentine arm that had wrapped around his legs. Whatever this creature was, it was connected to a hovering silver disc that was in the air about 15 feet away. The Major stood there in horror as he watched this creature and the sergeant retreat into the crowd which then rose vertically into the sky. Of course, he radioed for help, and while he was taken to the hospital for observation, search teams were sent out immediately. It wouldn't happen until three days later that they would find the body of Sergeant Lovett, only 10 miles from the site where he was said to have disappeared from. The autopsy performed on him later also only raised more questions than answers, as his body was severely harmed. So, of course, there was an investigation that happened, and many people claim this investigation was detailed in a 600 page document labeled Project Grudge Report 13. But the problem with this is that no official information on Report 13 exists and the US government denies its very existence. Though Grudge Reports 1 through 12 have been declassified along with Report 14, no official mention or accounting of Report 13 exists and the story solely relies on secondhand accounts of the horrible incident. In our number four spot today, we have the cigar shaped UFO. Okay, so so let's set the stage. It's 2.45 a.m. on July 24th, 1948, and there are 20 passengers aboard a twin-engine propeller plane that is at 5,000 feet being flown from Houston to Atlanta by pilot Clarence S. Childs and co-pilot John B. Witted. Out of the 20 passengers on board, 19 of them are asleep at these early morning hours, and everything seems to be going as per usual, until it wasn't. The two pilots and the one passenger who is awake all witnessed the same thing about 20 miles southeast of Montgomery, Alabama. About a week after the incident, the pilot explained what he had seen by saying, quote, it was clear there were no wings present, that it was powered by some jet or other type of power shooting flame from the rear some 50 feet. There were two rows of windows which indicated an upper and a lower deck, and from inside these windows, a very bright light was glowing. Underneath the ship, there was a blue glow of light. By his estimates, he watched the UFO for about 10 seconds seconds before it completely vanished. The co-pilot gave a similar explanation and also added, quote, the object was cigar shaped and seemed to be about 100 feet in length. The fuselage appeared to be about three times the circumference of a B-29 fuselage. It had two rows of windows, an upper and a lower. The windows were very large and seemed square. They were white with light, which seemed to be caused by some type of combustion. I asked Captain Childs what we had just seen, and he said that he didn't know. Well, this is obviously all very strange and peculiar. What has driven UFO enthusiasts even more is the fact that this strange sighting was of course later investigated by the US government, but the results of that investigation have allegedly been mostly destroyed. Does that mean that they found something they aren't willing to share yet? Some believe that perhaps the pilots and the passenger witnessed a secret Soviet spy craft, while others believe it was definitely something of the extraterrestrial variety. In our number three spot today, we have the Lubbock incident. On August 25th, 1951 in Lubbock, Texas, a group of scientists from the Texas Technical College were all hanging out in the backyard of geology professor Dr.
Dr. W. I. Robinson. They were all just chilling, enjoying each other's company until around 9:20 p.m. when they saw something very strange. It was a V-shaped formation of 15 to 30 bluish green lights passing overhead. They were completely confused over what it could be, but figured that the lights would likely reappear, which they did. About an hour later, the lights reappeared, and at this point, all these scientists knew that they had witnessed something exceptionally interesting, but what was it? The scientists weren't the only ones to witness the lights either. About 350 miles away in Albuquerque, New Mexico, an employee of the Atomic Energy Commission's top secret Sandia Corporation, who had a high-level Q security clearance, had been sitting outside with his wife, quote, gazing at the night sky, commenting on how beautiful it was, when both of them were startled at the sight of a huge airplane flying swiftly and silently over their home. On the aft edge of the wings, there were six to eight pairs of soft, glowing bluish lights. There were more sightings as well, all reporting a similar thing. The group of scientists began investigating, tracking the lights, which they witnessed 12 more times. They measured the angle of the lights, they tracked the speed, and they attempted, unsuccessfully, to try and measure the UFO's altitude. Here's the deal with this though. The government did end up investigating, but the official explanation for these lights is the most cryptic message I've ever seen. It read, quote, I thought that the professor's lights might have been some kind of birds reflecting the light from mercury vapor street lights, but I was wrong. They weren't birds. They weren't refracted light, but they weren't spaceships. The lights that the professor saw have been positively identified as a very commonplace and easily explainable natural phenomena. I can't divulge exactly the way the answer was found because it is an interesting story of how a scientist set up complete instrumentation to track down the lights. Telling the story would lead to his identity, and in exchange for his story, I promised the man complete anonymity. Despite people claiming that the mystery has been solved by this explanation, people are left with a lot more questions than answers. In our number two spot today, we have the Shag Harbor Incident. This UFO encounter is often referred to as Canada's Roswell, so I was shocked that I hadn't heard of it before. Basically, this incident took place on October 4th, 1967, when an unknown object crashed into the water near Shag Harbor, which is a tiny town in Nova Scotia. There were at least 11 people who witnessed this object as it crashed, and many people claimed to have heard a whistling sound followed by a loud bang when the crash took place. The witnesses that claimed to have seen the UFO were all doing a bunch of different things at the time. One couple was just sitting on their porch, but the two witnesses that really get me are a flight pilot and a ship captain. On Air Canada Flight 305, First Officer Robert Ralph pointed out to Captain Pierre Charbonneau that there was something strange at the left side of the aircraft. They reported an object tracking along on a parallel course a few miles away and described it as a brilliantly lit rectangular object with a string of smaller lights trailing the object. Shortly after after they first noticed it, there was a large but silent explosion near the unknown object, and then two minutes later there was a second explosion, but this one faded to a blue cloud. As for the ship captain, Captain Leo Howard Mercy, he saw four blips on his DECA radar that were totally stationary. This led to him looking up to the sky, and that is when he saw four bright objects sitting in a rectangular formation about 28 kilometers from the vessel's window. He wasn't the only one who saw it on board, the entire crew of of nearly 20 fishermen stood on deck and watched. A man named Lori Wickens was another one of the witnesses and he and some of his friends ended up calling the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, because they saw a huge object floating in the Atlantic Ocean about a thousand feet off of the shore. This is all super weird and not only the RCMP, but also the Royal Canadian Navy and the Royal Canadian Air Force became involved in investigation, but nothing was ever recovered or found, but it was also revealed that all commercial, private and military aircrafts along the eastern seaboard were accounted for, so what could have all these witnesses seen? Since they have never officially identified what it was, in the official Government of Canada documents, it is listed as a UFO. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the Westall Incident. Taking it back to 1966, we have the largest mass UFO sighting in Australia that, at the time, was largely ignored. This incident took place when over 300 students and staff members of a school in Melbourne all witnessed multiple UFOs silently flying through the air before they landed in a nearby field. While there's been a ton of speculation about this incident in the many years it's been, one witness account stands out among the rest, and that is the account made by the science teacher from the school, Andrew Greenwood. He was alerted to the UFO event by a hysterical student, and when he 
he went outside to see for himself, everything changed. Previously a skeptic of UFO stories, Andrew's mind was abruptly changed when he saw, as he described it, a round silver object about the size of a car with a metal rod sticking up in the air. He went on to explain that suddenly, five planes came and surrounded the object, all while more people were gathering to watch. He called what happened next the most amazing flying he has ever seen, explaining that quote, every time they got too close to the object it would slowly accelerate, then rapidly accelerate, and then move away from them and stop. Then they would take off after it again, and the same thing would happen. This went on for about 20 minutes before the mysterious object just vanished. As weird as this all was, what was almost weirder was what happened next. Firstly, the headmaster of the school is said to have tried to put a stop to anyone talking about the incident at all, threatening severe punishment to any student or staff who was caught speaking about it. And when the Royal Australian Air Force contacted him, he refused to talk to them at all about it. There have also been stories of witnesses getting visits from people warning them not to speak of the incident. Andrew explained, quote, when he asked the physical education teacher to describe what she had seen herself so that he could compare it with his own observation, she just wouldn't say anything. Another witness who did talk to Andrew and described what she had seen in great detail, just 30 minutes later refused to speak to him and wouldn't say a word. Was this because of the threats from the headmaster? Or was something else going on here? This is definitely one strange UFO story that leaves behind a lot of questions. Alrighty, in fifth place we have an unknown landmark. Ross Colehart, the author of In Plain Sight, an investigation into UFOs and impossible science, recently pondered in an interview about what if a UFO is so big it can't be moved. Well, the host wanted to know just how big big is, Ross replied that it would be so big they built a building over it in a country outside of the United States of America since it was unable of being moved. Now before someone out there gets snarky with me about an unknown maybe, Ross claims to know exactly where it is and that it's absolutely gobsmacking that it's been kept a secret. Imagine having an object that's so big it's just not conceivable to move it. He's one of the few people who has had the opportunity to interview government whistleblower David Grush, a veteran of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and the National Recognizance Office, who I'll talk about more later. I promise. Question for you folks out there, which landmark do you think could be hiding a UFO? Ross seems to be keeping tight lipped, but I'm going to guess the Tower of Pisa, since that would explain, you know, why it's never been able to stand straight, you know, outside of the simple poor foundation reason. Let me know in the comments what y'all think, I'm sure someone out there knows more than me. Coming in at number 4 are the Las Vegas Nevada aliens. While most people know Nevada for its scorching deserts and high temperatures, or maybe they know it for the Vegas Strip, its vibrant nightlife, and surplus of casinos, I know Nevada for the fact that it's home to none other than Area 51. If you don't know what Area 51 is, it is a highly secretive and classified United States Air Force facility located in the Nevada desert. The site's purpose has yet to be disclosed to the public, with much of its activities being shrouded in secrecy. Due to various theories and claims, Area 51's true purpose is to research extraterrestrial activity, UFOs, and to even harbor alien life and technology. So when a bright green space object lights up the sky and lands in someone's backyard in Nevada, it's hard not to assume aliens. And that's exactly what happened on April 30th of this year around 11.50pm in Las Vegas. Footage from police body cams shows the supposed UFO beaming low across the sky. Several people across eastern California, Nevada, and Utah reported seeing the flash during its brief descent. After seeing the light, officers were quick to receive a call from the landing site, the backyard of a Nevada family. Family would describe whatever landed in their backyard as nearly 10 feet tall, with large eyes and inhuman features. They noted two of these creatures, one standing outside and the other indoors. The fearful expressions on the family's faces in the body cam footage suggest that this close encounter of the third kind was no prank. However, footage of the backyard has been removed for the sake of the family's privacy. But it seems that the aliens were gone before police could get to seeing them anyway. As the officers left the scene, one of the witnesses said he was uneasy spending the night at home after what he'd seen. And I'm with him. I don't know about you, but if I saw two 8 to 10 foot aliens in my backyard, I'd probably move houses. No cities. Actually scratch that, I'd be in a different continent after an encounter with a pair of extraterrestrial visitors. What would you guys do if you saw an alien on your lawn? Run for the hills? Leave out food? Make friends? Let us know in the comments below.
In third place, we have claims from a government whistleblower. See, I told y'all I'd talk more about David. Alrighty, before I get into it, I'd like to elaborate on just how credible this witness is. So this whistleblower, David Charles Grush, is a veteran of the NGA that I mentioned earlier and the NRO, where he served as a representative to the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force from 2019 to 2021. From late 2021 to July of 2022, he was the NGA co-lead for UAP analysis and its representative to the task force led by the Department of the Navy under the Office of the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security. At the NGO, David served as a Senior Intelligence Capabilities Integration Officer cleared at the top secret compartment information level. From 2016 to 2021, he served with the NRO as Senior Intelligence Officer and led the production of the NRO Director's Daily Briefing. So he was a GS-15 civilian, the military equivalent of a colonel, and has numerous awards and decorations for his participation in covert and clandestine operations to advance American security. David said the recoveries of partial fragments through and up to intact vehicles have been made for decades through the present day by the government, its allies, and defense contractors. He said that the craft recovery operations are ongoing at various levels of activity, and that individuals on these UAP programs have approached him in his official capacity and disclosed their concerns regarding a multitude of wrongdoings, such as, you know, illegal contracting against the federal acquisition regulations and other criminality and the suppression of information across a qualified industrial base and academia. Associates who vouched for David said his information was highly sensitive providing evidence that materials from objects of non-human origin are in the possession of highly secret black programs. Wow multiple government witnesses to boot. Although locations, program names, and other specific data remain classified, the Inspector General and Intelligence Committee staff were provided with these details. Analysis has determined that the objects retrieved are of non-human origin, based on the vehicle morphologies and material science testing and the possession of unique atomic arrangements and radiological signatures. The investigation was centered on extensive interviews with high-level intelligence officials, some of whom are directly involved with the program, and they corroborated his information. David is certain that the information has been illegally withheld from Congress to intentionally thwart legitimate congressional oversight of the UAP program. He has also filed a complaint alleging that he suffered illegal retaliation for his confidential disclosures. In his statements, David claimed that UFO legacy programs have long been concealed within multiple agencies nesting UAP activities in conventional secret access programs, without appropriate reporting to various oversight authorities. According to the unclassified complaint, he had confidently provided classified information to the Department of Defense Inspector General concerning the withhold of UAP-related information from Congress. Christopher Mellon, who spent nearly 20 years in the U.S. intelligence community and served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, has worked with Congress for years on UAPs. He has mentioned that a number of well-placed current and former officials have shared detailed information with them, including the location where a craft was abandoned and recovered. He claims the reason more folks haven't come forward is due to a lack of trust in the leadership of the All-Domain Anomaly Resolution Office established by Congress. The assumption that the United States alone has bullied the other nations into maintaining the secrecy for nearly a century continues to prevail as the primary consensus amongst the public at large. So you're telling me that credible U.S. government officials have been adamant that the government is hiding things? And we're just talking about this now? <gasps> for second, we have a doozy. Alien marbles found on the ocean floor. So to really get the full picture, let's rewind a bit. The date is January 8, 2014. Life is good, Apple Watch hasn't come out yet, and more importantly, there are no UFOs in the sky. That is, until CNEOS 2014-01-08 crashes into the Pacific Ocean near the northeast coast of Papua New Guinea. It's strange shape, baffling scientists, and causing concern. Skip ahead to 2019, and the object is finally found at the ocean floor and classified as an interstellar meteor, which pretty much means it's a meteor that comes from outside our solar system. However, interest in the object did not end there. As in 2020, Harvard astronomer Avi Lieb would go on to suggest that this meteor is more than meets the eye. That the meteor was not of natural origin, but in fact a discarded piece of extraterrestrial technology. He came to this conclusion after finding out that the interstellar meteor was both incredibly rare in both composition and speed. As the object was physically tougher than all known meteorites, including those made of iron. And it moved faster than 95% of nearby stars relative to the sun, which is pretty fast. 
Leib's claims have sparked significant debate within the scientific community, with some agreeing with the Harvard professor and others choosing to doubt him. But this all changed last June, when a crew aboard a boat called the Silver Star embarked on an expedition to Papua New Guinea in hopes of recovering fragments from the mysterious object. It took them two weeks, but the team were able to cover over 100 miles of ocean bed before finally recovering 50 tiny spheres composed of a metallic substance that is unmatched to any existing alloys in our entire solar system. How tiny are these spheres you ask? Well, they're so small that they require a microscope to see. And at the moment, require more testing to determine whether or not these spheres are of natural or artificial origin. Depending on the results of this testing, humanity could be making its first confirmed alien contact ever. With these spheres found nearly a decade after the UFO's landing, it begs the question of what other alien fragments could be laying hidden across the globe. If any of you guys happen to have a bag of microscopic marbles, might be worth checking to see what they really are. And in first place, we have the Bermuda Triangle. So explorer Daryl Miklos has been using secret maps created by famed NASA Explorer Daryl Miklos has been using secret maps created by famed NASA astronaut Gordon Cooper to find shipwrecks in the Caribbean. Using these maps that were put together in the 1960s and that have been used to identify more than a hundred magnetic anomalies in the Caribbean, Daryl dived at an undisclosed location near the Bahamas to investigate what he thought could be an ancient shipwreck. The huge unidentified submerged object, USO for short, because y'all know I like my short forms, has 15 300 feet long obtrusions jutting from its side. In an interview, he described what he found and explained that he and his team want to bring the alien spaceship to the surface. He recalled that he and his team were capturing a moment of the Bahamas on, you know, an English shipwreck trail, and he was sitting in a two-man submersible. He was trying to identify the shipwreck material based on one of the anomaly readings on the charts when he noticed something that stuck out and shocked the heck out of him. He described it as a formation unlike anything he'd ever seen related to shipwreck material, because this was just too big for that. It was also something that was just overall completely different from anything he'd ever seen that was made by nature. Struggling to describe it, he said that it was almost like there were five arms coming out of a steep wall cliff, and each one is the size of a firearm on a battleship. They're enormous, and there's, like I said, 15 in total. Apparently, there were identical formations in three different areas that didn't look to be made in nature, but also didn't look man-made. Certainly nothing he'd ever seen based on his experience. Now, Daryl has many years of experience, having identified multiple different types of shipwreck material, and he's adamant that this spawning differs from the rest. The deepest part of the site is 300 feet below the surface. Divers had to use special breathing stuff and a state-of-the-art submarine just to access it. The explorer also found other bizarre and unexplained formations around the main object, all of which are covered in thick coral, which he believes are hundreds if not thousands of years old. Blown away by the discovery, when back on board his actual ship, he decided to, you know, dig further into Cooper's files to find clues. Significantly, the astronaut had written unidentified object on the chart of the area, rather than mentioning any historical shipwreck. Gordon Cooper not only believed in aliens, but also believed that we had visitors from other planets that landed in that particular area of the world. Daryl claimed Cooper gave him the maps, which included, you know, those detailed charts and exact coordinates, but this was after the man passed away in 2004. Daryl has stated that he simply wants to investigate the unknown and see what it is, because it may be nature made, just a freak of nature, but given its placement in this particular part of the Caribbean, and given what, you know, Gordon had told him about visitors from another planet, and the things that he's seen, he thinks it's definitely worthwhile investigating. During his post-NASA career, former U.S. Air Force, Cooper, you know, became well known as an outspoken believer in UFOs and claimed the US government was covering up its knowledge of extraterrestrial activity. He called for a top level coordinator program to scientifically collect and analyze data from all over the earth concerning any type of encounter and to determine how to best to interface with visitors in a friendly fashion. He revealed that every day in the United States, the radar instruments capture objects of form and composition unknown to this world. Daryl said that Cooper often told him stories of UFO sightings and believed a lot of the world's technological advances had been passed on to government by messengers from alien planets. But as for Cooper being a UFO nut, Daryl couldn't disagree more, describing him as a close friend who was of sane mind that wanted nothing to do with a lot of conspiracy theorists and UFO nut jobs. His words, not mine. A direct quote from Dale explained that Cooper was an honest, straightforward individual who only wanted to investigate and explore the possibilities of the unknown, even if it meant risking his professional career. He truly believed in what he saw, and he tried to tell it in such a way to make people believe it. And he knew because of his background in NASA as a rocket scientist that he was more credible than most. He waited until later in life to reveal what he knew out of fear of being killed by the government, which is pretty dang valid if you ask me. And since you're watching, 
I'm assuming you are? Number 5 Camp Wilson So we find ourselves in a truly remarkable moment as a new wave of UFO sightings takes center stage this year and NASA can no longer afford to turn a blind eye to this unexplained phenomenon. Together let's travel to the California desert where an event unfolded that eerily echoes the famous 1997 Phoenix Lights incident. Now if you're a fan of a channel you've heard me talk about this before, if not I've done plenty of other videos on it. Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp, known for their groundbreaking investigations, brought to light footage from April of 2021, filmed over 29 palms. This sighting is far from your typical blurry UFO footage. The object described as a giant black triangular shape with lights on its edges was captured from multiple angles by six videos, with the accompanying high exposure photograph revealing even more detail. Witnesses, including over 50 US Marines, were baffled by the object's sudden appearance, size, and behavior. Like I said before, the incident closely resembles the Phoenix Lights, where a massive triangular UFO was witnessed by thousands. It's important to note that the witnesses in this case aren't your average civilians. They are trained military personnel, artillerymen, and mortarmen who have dealt with illumination rounds and various military aircraft. And their unanimous conclusion? This was unlike anything they had ever encountered. Specifically speaking, a mortar man serving at Camp Wilson during this incident spoke with Corbell and took a high exposure photo on his smartphone, which revealed the outline of, you know, this object. It appears to be triangular, surrounded by lights spaced evenly around its edge in a V formation. Now, the mortar man, who was staying anonymous for safety reasons, described how one of his companions witnessed the object materialize from nowhere, saying, One of my buddies was outside. He was looking at the sky and said it just kind of appeared out of nowhere. And we all came out and looked, and then slowly, like 50 plus people started coming out looking. Those lights appeared out of nowhere. Hey, he said it twice. He was adamant. He added that despite their military experience, none of the Marines could recognize the craft, and described their reaction as you guessed it, baffled. Now this man who filmed and photographed the object said, if you look at the picture, you can see a black triangular shape. But the picture I took with the black triangular shape underneath the lights, it's definitely not any type of flare thing or illumination rounds. The witness said the apparent object remained stationary for approximately 10 minutes. But also like a marine can be overheard on one of the videos saying that the triangle might have been in motion. Another marine who saw it was serving as an artillery man at the base when he saw the UFO. He firmly rejected any suggestions that the lights could be attributed to illumination rounds that could have been, you know, sent off by artillery or any other mundane explosion explanation he might have recognized, saying, This was something none of us had ever seen before. It was a completely different color. The size and the illumination was different. He explained that when they fire off illumination rounds, it's one. You send it in the air and let it drop, and then you send off another one. This was like five next to each other, and they're kind of reddish, and our usual illumination rounds are a yellow-white color. The UFO's disappearance, just as illumination rounds were fired over it, adds a layer of mystery. Helicopters and a massive military convoy swiftly converged on the scene, leaving us to ponder what exactly was the government's involvement in all this. The parallels between this and Phoenix Lights are undeniable. Both incidents feature large triangular objects with lights, hovering over military facilities, and then inexplicably vanishing. It's a real head scratcher. And as more details emerge, it's clear that NASA and other space agencies will need to address the growing body of evidence related to these unidentified aerial phenomena. Which is something I've been saying for, you know, how many months have I been here again? Number four, the Go Fast video. So this video uploaded by the UFO investigative group to the STARS Academy of Arts and Sciences in March of 2018 was secured by a Freedom of Information Act request to the US government. The video was taken in 2015 off of the East Coast by an FA-18F fighter jet using the aircraft's onboard Raytheon an asq 228 Advanced Targeting Forward Looking Infrared Pod, also known as ATF LIR. I know myself too well, I'm gonna trip over my tongue if I try saying that more than once, so it should be called ATF for short. ATF is designed to allow pilots to track, target, and destroy targets on the ground at ranges of up to 40 miles. Now it should be noted that ATF is good at spotting, but not engaging aerial targets. The video, nicknamed Go Fast, My To The Stars, starts by explaining the various numbers and symbols that appear in the footage. Things like the aircraft's altitude, which was around 25,000 feet, and the fact that the ATF was pointed ahead and to the left of the Super Hornet. The readout also explains that the aircraft was traveling at 252 knots, and in a 5 degree turn, and the unknown object was approximately 4.4 nautical miles away. The video shows the Super Hornet's weapon system operator repeatedly trying to acquire the UFO with the ATF's built-in auto tracker, which can, you know, pick out an object and keep it centered on camera. After two tries, the weapon system officer, or WSO, shouts, whoa, got it, to which another person, assumed to be the pilot, says, woohoo, whoa, not to sound like Mario or anything. What the bleep is that thing? The pilot asks. The WSO later says, oh my gosh, dude, to which the pilot replies, whoa, 
What is that man? Now yes, this is where skeptics might start asking, but Alexa, how is this unknown object different from weird government aircrafts we don't know about? Well doubters, let me count thy ways. For starters, the UFO does not have any kind of hot exhaust trail that would be emitted by a conventional turbine engine, appearing to emit no heat on the ATF sensor. And secondly, the UFO doesn't have any visible wings or fins. Through my research, I've learned that even cruise missiles such as the American Tomahawk or Russian Caliber have small winglets that should be visible, and other missiles such as the Maverick anti-tank missile have stubby fins. The UFO appears oval like and does not appear to fly nose first in the direction of travel. So once again, this was a video hidden and released by the government, so uh, NASA, any comment? Number 3. Las Vegas Aliens Want to go gambling? One sighting this year in Las Vegas shows shadowy figures lurking somewhere in the shot. You can watch the creepy footage, you know, and see if you can spot them. This video is one of many supposed UFO sightings in Vegas just this year, with another sighting around the incident even involving police officer. But this particular video shows a group of people looking kind of nervous as they look into a backyard behind a house, with the camera zooming in on a forklift truck which has shadowy figures looking inside. Now there was a fair bit of confusion over where the extraterrestrials are in the video, but many people insist they're there, including me. For example, one comment wrote, you can see their face, eyes glowing in the first tractor. Then look at the second one, you can see it peaking, they're on like 8 to 10 feet tall. Another wrote, face a little left of the center of the circle, you can see the eyes and the mouth. So this video could offer fresh insight into the um, plethora of encounters and sightings that Vegas has recently seen. Police body cam footage emerged in June showing lights hovering in the sky before plummeting to the ground in a suspected UFO crash landing sighting. Officers carried out an extensive search following reports of the mysterious figures, with no new evidence being uncovered. However, an eyewitness to the suspected crash landing spoke out and claimed they witnessed the whole thing, and even stumbled across an extraterrestrial. Apparently my brother told me to look behind the forklift, and I did. I saw the alien creature. So when I saw it, it was a tall, skinny, lengthy creature, according to this YouTuber. He was a grey, greenish color, and when I looked it in the eyes, my whole body just froze. Bear in mind, I'm looking at his whole body. He has weird looking feet and a big face and eyes. Yes, there could be numerous theories about the existence of alien life. Many people believe that the universe is simply too big for us to be alone, no matter how unlikely life is to develop. And with that, one theory about why we haven't encountered aliens is that we were being snubbed by the galactic community, either because we're too stupid or too nasty, which like, mm, fair. Another interesting idea is that intelligent life has evolved several times in the universe. However, the lifespan of an intelligent civilization compared to the universe as a whole is so relatively short that intelligent civilizations might never have coexisted, as one goes extinct before another emerges. Let me know in the comments what your theories are. Number 2. CBP Footage US Customs and Border Protection, so CBP for short, quietly released a slew of records and videos of UFOs in August of this year, specifically 12 videos which were released in response to a Freedom of Information Act request, all of which allegedly contained footage of UFOs. Now all the footage is available for download and is accompanied by a UFO report titled The Pentagon's UAP Task Force, Midi Security and Police Studies Number 183. The report is an older document said to be written by Frank Milburn and had something to do with the Fagan Sadat Center for Strategic Studies at the Bar Ulan University. It's unclear precisely what the report has to do with the videos, which are pretty stunning on their own. One of the videos clearly shows an orb flying in close proximity to a plane, to the point where it appears the orb is chasing the plane through the sky. It's clear the object isn't moving like any other craft known to man. Most of the footage appears to show some type of orb following an aircraft or flying over land, and in one particular video, we can see one of these super fast objects glide over what appears to be some type of urban development or military base. So what are these orbs? We have no idea. They've shown up consistently around army installations and seem particularly fascinated with military activity. But other than that, we're still none the wiser as to what the heck is going on in our skies. The videos, some of which leaked already a few years back, have added fuel to the already raging fire of public discourse around flying saucers. One video in particular from 2013 shows an unidentifiable spot flying over an airport. The video is black and white and the footage is a little grainy, and the object, whatever it is, cruises over the airport at what appears to be a consistent rate, on a path taking it towards the ocean. It is look at all that unusual, like if you had already told me it was a bird or a small, you know, UAP, I'd believe it. But the trouble starts when it gets near the water and appears to change shape. Shortly thereafter, the object seems to disappear, reappear, and then vanish for good. Some folks have interpreted that as the object having dipped beneath the water and emerged again, seemingly without losing any speed, which would be an impressive engineering achievement. But the video is so poor, it could just as easily be a digital artifact. Look, we've filled the space around us with a growing number of cameras and orbiting satellites, and they're recording all the time. More than that, we as humans are creating more technology Technology, some of which isn't public knowledge. It was probably inevitable that we would start to catch things on camera that we can't explain. But there's a pretty big gap between look at that weird thing and uh, I bet it came from across the stars. Still, 
there is some weird stuff going on in the sky, and hey NASA, we should probably devote some resources to figuring out what it is. With that in mind though, apparently Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Senator Mike Rounds introduced an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act, which would establish a structure for how and when UAP documents would be released to the public. So for example, for decades, many Americans have been fascinated by, you know, what the heck's out there, and it's long past time they got some answers. The Americans, Canadians, everybody has a right to learn about technologies of unknown origins, non-human intelligence, and unexplainable phenomena. So apparently we're not only working to declassify what the government has previously learned about these, you know, phenomena, but also to create a pipeline for future research to be made public. The bill requires that the government agencies turn over any UAP information they possess within 300 days of the act going into effect. All of which is to say we're at least like a year and a half out from seeing the extraterrestrial goods, so I'm going to keep screaming at NASA if you don't mind. Number 1. George Arteaga footage So over the last year, if you couldn't tell by today, unexplainable objects have been appearing in the sky baffling a lot of folks, especially pilots. So some pilots believe that these fast orbiting objects aren't satellites or known military aircraft. Specifically, pilot George Ateaga remembers the event of what he claims was the most frightening experience of his life, where a circular object flew directly in front of his plane and whizzed directly by his window. He and his co-pilot Daniel were flying towards Medellin when they noticed the strange object. Now thankfully our pilot was able to turn his plane around and the unidentified object moved towards them. He also caught the first video of the stationary object. He was able to fly past the object, and he doesn't think it was a balloon because ideally the wind from the plane should have blown it away. The pilot believes that whatever he saw was once again not a balloon by any measure as he was way too high up and it was way too cold for a balloon to float free. Soon after he posted the video on Twitter, it was uploaded by an Instagram handle named The Hood's Finest and the video went viral and viewers speculated that uh, what he saw was definitely a UFO. The pilot claims the aircraft was traveling at a speed of 300 kilometers an hour, with temperatures falling close to uh, around 5, and in those conditions, the state Taking a balloon or a bird for a UFO is very unlikely. Once again, hey NASA, wanna weigh in? Good evening, UFO lovers of the interwebs. I'm Alexa, resident ookie spooky girly, and today I just can't contain my excitement. It's a part three video. I've never had my videos do well enough to earn a third installment, so from the bottom of my heart, I thank you all for your love of all things out of this world because it constantly blows my mind. I've gotta say, like, I was never super fascinated by UFOs when I was younger, since my hometown was weird enough without them, but nowadays I can't seem to be ever satisfied with the knowledge that I have. I'm always craving more. Question for y'all, what's your favorite UFO spotting story in history? Let me know in the comments. Personally speaking, other than Roswell, my favorite encounter is kicking around number one today, so uh, be sure to make sure to stick around for that. And also stick around for another edition of Comment Section Shoutouts. I'm having fun with this. On that note, folks, welcome to the mysterious UFO footage NASA can no longer ignore, part three. Number 5. Italian Observatory So back in 2007, astronomer Alberto Mayer, living in Busto Arezzo, <laughs> I think I got that right, over in Italy, made an incredible discovery, almost completely by accident, which hey, that's how most scientific progress gets made. Or maybe just me. He was adjusting the focus of his telescope when he spotted and tracked a UFO as it flew across the surface of the moon. Now the video shows the portions of the moon that he was focused on in close-up mode, while tracking a solid black object as it flew over the surface. Now sure, I could just describe what is going on in this video, but I could also let you see it and decide for yourselves, which makes a lot more sense in my brain. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, so here's roughly, here are the one, 24,000 words worth of content if my math makes sense, which is about a 50-50 chance. Take a look! Pretty weird, eh? So the round black object is tracked as he catches, you know, it just after it passes the Wallace Crater. And today this is how I'm learning parts of the moon were named. It hovers and hesitates before making a sudden change of path at an exact 45 degree angle. The precision and control is what gives people pause, since it seems to move as if it's being controlled, and with such mechanical dominance that it seems like it has to be something being intentionally driven, not just a strange rock floating throughout the stars. Commenters on the video pointed out that the object doesn't decrease in size at all, suggesting that the object isn't that close to the moon, and rules out the theory that this is a shadow on the surface of the moon from a large object. Now look, I'm one girl. I'm only capable of so much. The science stuff, kind of outside of my range of expertise, but I can confirm and offer my, you know, speculation on UFO videos. And this is something. To quote one of my favorite phrases at the moment, I suppose, to be determined. Number four, the footage the Pentagon refuses to release from Alaska. So between February 4th to the 12th, you know, earlier this year, four different unidentified objects were forcibly taken down from the skies over Alaska, South Carolina, the Yukon, and the Great Lakes. While cockpit audio from F-16 pilots who, you know, took down the UFO over Lake Huron was released, a spokesman for the Pentagon has confirmed that footage will not be 
released in the near future, being quoted directly as saying, I can tell you that there is not currently any images or video footage that we can release. The imagery remains classified and I have not received any information as to the potential timeline on a change in classification. So usual government speak. This refusal is a drastic difference in comparison to the quick release of an Air Force photo of what was believed to be a Chinese spy balloon that was brought down at the same time over on the East Coast, and footage from where a Russian plane appeared to intentionally collide with a drone last March. Noted UFO researcher John Greenwald requested the footage and photos of the UFO you know, takedowns be released via a Freedom of Information Act, with the Pentagon claiming national security exemptions to deny this request. Because, you know, that's not scary at all. An Air Force official said that the images would reveal cryptology and national security concerns if released. And even the, you know, Canadian RCMP are playing coy, having ended their public search for the remains. Now look, I don't know about you folks at home, but that sounds pretty dang suspicious to me. And I think I know what I'm talking about at this point. So does anybody want to take a random trip to the Yukon just to sightsee? You know, totally not to recover UFO debris or anything suspicious? I'll start the car. I got room for uh, a couple of us. I drive a nice big SUV. Number three, the Guy Hotel Memo. So it's the most requested document in the FBI's archives, right after the photo of Elvis and Nixon riding with an alien. I wish I could make this stuff up, but the file has been checked out roughly a million times in the last two years alone. So as far as KG cover-ups go, this one's really out in the open, but that doesn't make it any less invigorating. Or confounding. It's a single page, an unconfirmed report that the FBI never even followed up on. The file in question? So it's a memo dated back to March of 1950, authored by one guy, Hotel, or Hotel, who served as the director of the FBI field office in Washington, D.C., addressed to FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. I know you all know that name. So in the memo, you know, Guy was relaying a story seen by an Air Force pilot about something bizarre they had seen in New Mexico. And this was right around the time of Roswell fever. The memo describes flying saucers, circular in shape with raised centers, approximately 50 feet in diameter. It goes on to say that inside each saucer was a flight crew, each occupied by three bodies of roughly human shape, but only three feet tall, and bandaged in a manner similar to blackout suits used by speed flyers and test pilots. The memo goes on to claim that the crafts were found because an aircraft radar had interfered with the controlling mechanisms of the saucer, and concludes by saying, no further evaluation was ever attempted. I don't know about you, but it seems like this should be a significantly bigger deal than that. You know, no further evaluation? Oh, you know, that's fine. Somebody in the Air Force claims they saw a series of flying saucers piloted by tiny men in Chinese spacesuits not even three years after the Roswell incident, you know, kind of took over New Mexico. But hey, it's nothing. At least I guess there's some comfort in knowing that the government has always behaved like this when it comes to investigating and reporting on possible UAP and UFO sightings. I believe it's worth mentioning that Project Blue Book was launched, was launched not even two years later, investigating UFO sightings in the Air Force. So once again, giving the government my usual dose of side eye and like, yo, what the heck? Number two, Ryan Graves report. So Ryan Graves is a studied Air Force pilot, an FA-18 Super Hornet pilot specifically, who has flown the skies for 10 years and has seen countless UFOs in his time flying for the Navy. You know, seen a lot of things he can't explain. He has recently spoke out saying these things would be out there all day. Keeping an aircraft in the air requires a significant amount of, you know, the speeds that we have observed. 12 hours in the air is about 11 hours longer than we'd expect. On one particular incident back in late 2014, a Super Hornet pilot nearly crashed into one of these you know, unknown objects. Some of these objects were caught on plane camera, and so, because it's me, we have some of that footage for you today. The pilot and his wingman were flying in tandem about 100 feet apart over the Atlantic East when something flew between them. Now, Lieutenant Graves said that the object looked like a sphere encasing a cube. The pilots were concerned because they were, you know, a covert drone program, and government officials wouldn't have had them flying around fighter jets for fear of collision. It was this that had the Navy concerned that perhaps there was more to investigate with this particular encounter. But what was truly unsettling the pilots, you know, besides the fact that there was an intense possible safety crash, was that these were accelerating to hypersonic speeds, stopping and turning on a dime, which is not really something that human pilots are capable of. So what do the pilots think they were dealing with? Graves did speak out saying, you know, we have helicopters that can hover. We have an aircraft that can fly at 30,000 feet and right at the surface. But combine all that in one vehicle of the some type with no jet engine, no exhaust plume? That's not possible. So what do we think, folks? This seems like something worth digging into, right? Suspicious? Hands up? Who's with me? I knew y'all would. Number one, the 2004 series of spottings. So on November 14th of 2004, Lieutenant Alex Dietrich was piloting her FA-18 Super Hornet. Yep, that's a very popular plane. When she observed an oblong shape hovering over the water, it leapt into motion, skimming 500 to 1,000 feet over the waves at around 500 knots. And for those of us Canucks, that's around 925 kilometers per hour, which is faster than I can get my vehicle. I like to get it to like 120, and that's it. The fighter jet's onboard radar couldn't detect the object, but Alex's weapon system 
Systems Operator in the Rossi, whose uh, name isn't public for safety reasons, witnessed it as well. Now, Alex quoted her recollection as, you know, we were trying to call out what we were seeing to each other and to make sure everybody else is seeing it. It's moving so erratically and so fast that our voices, our minds, and that our radio calls can't even keep up with it. Now, look, the majority of credible modern day UFO sightings can be credited to those that work in the Air Force. And it should be noted that military pilots are trained at what they call RIS, short for, you know, reconnaissance, reconnaissance. Every time I say it, somebody corrects me in the comments, so I'm not even going to try this time. And referring more specifically in this case to the art of recognizing aircrafts by their shapes, paint schemes, unit insignia, and more. On one of the other Super Hornets that launched was Lieutenant Commander Chad Underwood, who was able to capture the object on an infrared camera. It was about 40 feet long, round and smooth, and quickly received the nickname Tic Tac. Yep, you guessed it, this is my favorite UFO story. Now all of the footage that the US government has confirmed as authentic and, you know, unexplained speak for itself since I know we have the clip handy. And around this time, starting on November 10th to be exact, Gary Voorhees, a petty officer on the USS Princeton guided missile cruiser, had been reporting apparitions on his radar screens in the same area. Triple checking his equipment before he made his report, and being the main technician responsible for said equipment, along with having six years of Navy experience at the time, he described what he was seeing as impossible. Possible. In just seconds, an object had dropped to the waterline from 60,000 feet, hovered, and then zipped away at high velocity, making right angle turns that were quoted as being confounding and defying gravity. A Relax, book advance. I'm right here with you. The objects returned for the next week, with Voorhees quoted as saying, I was able to see it on the horizon, during the night and during the day, and it was definitely a glowing object. Could I tell you for 100% certainty what exactly it was we were tracking? Nope. Now, footage of this event used to exist, with Gehring being able to vividly describe his memories, but has since been completely scrubbed from the internet. So, um, hey NASA, wanna, you know, pipe up? Number five. All right, the 2019 Jackson spotting. Folks, we are starting today off with the usual disclaimer that if the footage or photos that I'm talking about don't appear, it's because they've disappeared from the interwebs between when I did my research and when this hits the World Wide Web. Which honestly, in my personal opinion, leads me to believe we're on the right track to the point where the men in black are watching or I just have the worst luck. 50-50. So in August of 2019, an intriguing video surfaced on the internet raising questions that uh, NASA can't easily dismiss. The footage sent to Buckrail website by an anonymous reader shows a mysterious flying object over Jackson Hole, which is located in Wyoming, by the way. I thought it was in Florida. This unidentified phenomenon occurred during the Perside meteor shower, but it exhibited peculiar characteristics that challenged conventional explanations. The anonymous observer, working a night shift, initially thought it might be a meteor, but it moved way too too slow and seemingly too close to the ground for that. So after checking flight records, no aircrafts were reported in that airspace at that time. And what truly baffled the observer was a sudden brilliant flash at the end of the object's trajectory, illuminating the sky. Such an occurrence defied conventional wisdom, leading to the tongue-in-cheek speculation of aliens in their sleep-deprived state. Hey, after analyzing the video frame by frame, experts ruled out meteors due to the object's brightness and slow movement, which lacked the characteristic streak of meteors. Some suggested it could be a drone as drones, as drone regulations require visible lights, but the unknown flash remains unexplained. Michael Brotherton, a professor of astronomy, noted that the flash might not appear as bright in reality, considering the sensitivity of webcams to low light. A former Air Force pilot proposed the theory of a single ship fighter jet, possibly performing maneuvers with afterburners and flares. However, the absence of military training airspace in the area and the unusual time for a solo jet flight raises many doubts. In conclusion, the mystery persists, with the leading explanations being a drone or a lone fighter jet. But but the peculiar flash remains unaccounted for, leaving us with our unanswered questions. Was it actually a drone pilot's curiosity, a pilot showboating, or UFOs? This footage continues to baffle experts, and uh, yeah, it raises a lot of questions. So let me know in the comments what you think, because my brain is confounded. Number four, the Varginha incident. The Brazil's Roswell incident, known as the, we're gonna call it the V case, has resurfaced, igniting intrigue and sparking rumors of potential creature footage. Back in 1996, so the year before I was born, this incident garnered global attention, featuring a UFO crash, an alleged extraterrestrial encounter, and a subsequent military cover-up, despite official government denials. This enigma remains one of Brazil's most famous UFO cases, drawing UFO tourism to the city of V. Witnesses recounted a bizarre event in that January, when a strange cigar-shaped object crashed in, yep, the city of V. Locals observed its gradual descent, describing it as resembling a struggling washing machine. The incident was followed by the arrival of military personnel who cordoned off the area. Now, subsequent Frequently, a group of girls claimed to have encountered
encountered a strange creature with brown, oily skin, V-shaped feet, a large head, and huge red eyes. The Brazilian military later attributed this creature to a homeless man covered in mud, but the witnesses vehemently disagreed. They recalled the creature's fearful expression and alien characteristics, leading them to believe it was not a human or an animal. The mystery deepened when two military police officers reportedly captured the creature, only for one of them to suffer a fatal infection shortly afterwards. Now, the documentary that was recently. The recent documentary, Moment of Contact, has reignited interest in the case, featuring interviews with witnesses and an anonymous whistleblower known as Military X. This whistleblower claimed to have been involved in transporting the creature's body to the ESA Army base. His description of the creature's oily skin and V-shaped foot only added to the mystery and credibility. Additionally, a former Brazilian Air Force traffic controller alleged that the U.S. Air Force landed unannounced and dispatched helicopters to collect something in the city of V. The documentary concludes with the filmmakers pursuing video and photographic evidence, suggesting that such evidence exists somewhere in Brazil. Now, this incident occurred in a climate of increased UFO attention, both in Brazil and internationally. But with witnesses and whistleblowers sharing their accounts and claims of photographic evidence, the mystery of Brazil's Roswell remains a captivating enigma, challenging official explanations and leaving room for speculation and, you know, yeah. Hey NASA, any comment on this cover up? I'm not expecting it, but it'd be nice. Number three, Japanese British crossover event. I swear, I know that sounds like something out of an anime, but I promise you it's very, very real. The 2011 British government release of 8,500 pages of secret UFO reports, yep, 8,500, rekindled interest in UFO sightings and their possible connection to world crises. The reports point to a curious pattern of increased UFO sightings during times of significant events, such as natural disasters or um, wartime. In the aftermath of the devastating 8.9 magnitude earthquake in Japan, y'all remember that one, there had actually been numerous UFO sightings reported over the country, with video footage showing bright lights in the sky and UFOs skimming over the Pacific near the quake zones. One notable incident involved a rare air defense video from Japan showing a UFO flying near the nuclear-powered aircraft carrier USS Ronald Reagan as it arrived off Japan's coast to assist with disaster response. These sightings have sparked discussions and speculations about the connection between UFOs and global events. The British UFO files also reference American UFO research researcher Dr. Joseph Allen Hynek, who served as a consultant to the American Defense Department for about 15 years. The files suggest that Hynek's studies on world disasters and the relation to increased UFO sightings were influential in the UFO community. This correlation between significant events and UFO sightings raises um, some questions. I know I have plenty. The release of these files from, you know, the release of these files has shed light on the government's long-standing secrecy regarding UFO information, with accusations that people who reported UFO sightings were often ridiculed or dismissed. Furthermore, and uh, hold on to your butt folks, it has been revealed that discussions about UFO phenomenon took place at the highest levels of government worldwide. Like in 1979, the House of Lords held the first full debate among lawmakers on the subject, acknowledging thousands of credible UFO sightings reported by British police, government officials, and members of the Royal Air Force. The role of the House of Lords in keeping these UFO findings secret for over 60 years has raised many questions about the transparency of government institutions. Eh, you don't say. Additionally, the British media has criticized the Ministry of Defense for labeling people who reported UFOs as nutters while the House of Lords and even the Queen of England had knowledge of the secret UFO files. Yeah, you heard me correctly. The Queen knew about this and was just like, hmm, nah. Interestingly, the UFO files also mentioned the detection of 15 UFOs on radar approaching the United Kingdom on the day of September 11th. Yeah, of 2001. Remember that? Adding another layer of mystery to this phenomenon. These revelations from the British government's release of the files have ignited some discussions about, uh, have ignited some discussions worldwide about the intersection of UFO sightings, major world events, and government secrecy, prompting uh, further questions. I know I have plenty. Number two, Gulf Breeze footage. So the Gulf Breeze UFO incident, a series of claimed UFO sightings in Gulf Breeze, Florida during, 1970, during 1987 to 1988 remains a puzzling chapter in the history of UFOlogy. Or is it UFOlogy? Please let me know in the comments. At the heart of this curious tale is Ed Walters, a local contractor who reported numerous UFO encounters and provided photographs as evidence. This case drew significant attention from UFO researchers, skeptics, and the general public. In November of 1987, Ed captured attention by supplying photos of alleged UFO sightings to the Gulf Breeze Sentinel newspaper. These images, published under aliases to protect Walter's identity showed a mysterious craft in the skies above Gulf Breeze. Now, some experts, like Bruce Maccabee, believed the photographs to be genuine. Walter's own accounts of his experiences are intriguing, yet highly controversial. He reported being immobilized by a blue beam and took Polaroid photos of the UFO hovering above his home. He claimed to encounter the craft multiple times and even reported seeing land and aliens stepping out. He said the, ali he said the aliens communicated with him telepathically and presented him with a book of dog pictures. And then a blue beam of light lifted him off the ground. Hey, sounds 
sounds pretty straightforward to me. These extraordinary claims were supported by some, including a polygraph test that indicated Walters believed his photos were real. UFO researcher Bud Hopkins also interviewed Walters and believed in his authenticity, citing the fact that Walters turned down a significant book deal and once again passed a polygraph test. Granted, there were some strong skeptics. Ray Stanford, a paranormal investigator, focused on the background of the photos and was convinced they were hoaxes. In addition, another UFO investigator, Philip Class, thought the photos were inauthentic and not impressive to the public. And yes, somebody from NASA also raised some questions about the double exposure. We all know about that though. It's pretty easy to fake that. I don't think these were faked. Even within Gulf Breeze, the Gulf Breeze Sentinel's publication of the photos did lead to uh, numerous reported sightings in the area. Locals described various UFO phenomena, including some glowing stuff, beams of light, and a craft. The Gulf Breeze case had become a significant topic of discussion in the UFO community at the time. Once again, it's going to remain shrouded in mystery and controversy. Ed's claims and the accompanying photographs kind of divided some opinions. I'm on team that uh, it's compelling evidence. It's real. Number one, the Arctic UAP. So the recent surge in reports of unidentified flying objects, or now known as UAPs, has brought the question of extraterrestrial life into the forefront of public consciousness once again. A recent incident involving a Chinese spy balloon over the US and subsequent unexplained aerial phenomena kind of raises some concerns and questions about what on earth is happening in our skies. So let's go back to February of this year when uh, there was an incident that marked a series of mysterious aerial events. Let's go back to February of this year when there was a series of mysterious aerial events which captured our attention. It all began with a massive Chinese surveillance balloon that meandered across North America. This intrusion into US airspace prompted the use of military force to bring it down, leaving many Americans in disbelief that such an event could occur. What followed were three more perplexing incidents. What followed were three more perplexing incidents involving unknown objects. US fighters um, took down these objects over various locations, including Alaska, the Yukon here in Canada, and Michigan's Lake Huron. The fact that authorities admitted to having no idea about the origin or ownership of these objects deepens the mystery. However, it's the revelation of a fifth undisclosed in However, it's the revelation of a fifth undisclosed incident over the Arctic Circle on February 1st that truly raises some eyebrows. The involvement of eight or nine UAPs detected over the Arctic led to the deployment of fighter jets in an attempt to intercept them. Now, these objects exhibited high-speed maneuvering, eluding the pursuit of military aircraft. Former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense Christopher Mellon corroborated this account. It's a clear indication of a larger issue, the lack of transparency and information from the Air Force regarding UAPs. Popular outlet News Nation reached out to both the Pentagon and NORAD, but the responses didn't provide satisfactory answers. NORAD denied allegations of scrambling fighter jets to intercept UAPs, attributing aircraft presence in the area to a training operation. Also, there's an unsettling silence surrounding the Alaska object come down on February 10th. Despite the White House's assurances that debris recovery efforts would be made, none of that was happening. So are these advanced technologies, espionage activities, or something beyond our current understanding? Now come on, I can't be the only one getting a bad case of deja vu with this one. This is almost textbook with what the government did to cover up the Roswell case for years. In fifth place, we have the 2004 series of spottings. On November 14th of 2004, Lieutenant Alex Dietrich was piloting her FA-18 Super Hornet when she observed an oblong object hovering over the water. It leapt into motion, skimming 500 to 1,000 feet over the waves at around 500 knots. The fighter jet's onboard radar couldn't detect the object, but Alex's weapon system operator in the rear seat, whose name is not public, witnessed it as well. Alex has quoted her recollection as, We were trying to call out what we were seeing to each other and to make sure everybody else is seeing it. It's moving so erratically and so fast that our voices, our minds, and our radio calls just can't keep up with it. Now, the majority of credible modern-day UFO sightings ergo why it's on this list, can be credited to those that work in the Air Force. And it should be noted that military pilots specifically are trained at what they call RIS, short for reconnaissance, and referring more specifically in this case to the art of recognizing aircrafts by their shapes, paint schemes, unit insignia, and more. On one of the other Super Hornets that launched behind Alex was Lieutenant Commander Chad Underwood, who was able to capture the object on an infrared camera. It was around 40 feet long, round and smooth, and quickly received the nickname Tic Tac. Now, all of the footage that the U.S. government has confirmed as authentic and unexplained speak for itself since I know we have the clip handy. Around this time, starting on November 10th to be exact, Gary Forhees, a petty officer on the USS Princeton guided missile cruiser, had been reporting apparitions on his radar screens in the same area. Triple checking his equipment before he made his report, and being the main technician responsible for that equipment, along with having six years of Navy experience at the time, Forhees described what he was seeing as impossible. In just seconds, an object had dropped to the waterline from 60,000 feet, hovered, and then zipped away at high velocity, making right angle turns that were quoted as being confounding 
and defying gravity. I'm not Elphaba. The objects returned for the next week, with Voorhees quoted as saying, I was able to see it on the horizon during the night and during the day. And it definitely was a glowing object. Could I tell you for 100% certainty what it was exactly we were tracking? No. Now, footage of this event used to exist, with Gary being able to vividly describe his memories, but has since been completely scrapped from the internet. Just gonna give the Pentagon my usual dose of side I write about now. Don't mind me. In fourth place, we have the Washington Flap. At 11.40 p.m. on Saturday, July 19th of 1952, Edward Nugent, an air traffic controller at the Ronald Reagan Washington National Airport, try saying that five times fast, spotted seven objects on his radar. The objects were around 24 kilometers south-southwest of the city, not following any established flight paths, and no known aircrafts were in the area. Edward's superior, Harry Barnes, a senior air traffic controller at the airport, watched the objects on the radar scope later writing that they knew immediately that a very strange situation existed. Their movements were completely radical compared to those of any ordinary aircraft. Harry had two controllers check Edward's radar, and they found it was working normally. He then called the National Airport's radar-equipped control tower, and the controllers there said that they also had unidentified blips on their radar screen, and saw a hovering bright light in the sky that was moving at speeds they couldn't understand. At this point, other objects appeared in all sectors of the radar scope, and when they moved over the White House and the United States Capitol, Harry then called the Andrews Air Force Base, which was located around 10 miles away. Although they reported that they had no unusual objects on their radar, an airman soon called the base's control tower to report the sighting of a strange object. Airman William Brady, who was in the tower, saw an object which appeared to be like an orange ball of fire, trailing a tail, saying it was unlike anything he had ever seen before. Where have I said that already? As William tried to alert the other personnel in the tower, the strange object took off at an unbelievable speed. On one of the National Airport's runways, pilot S.C. Pierman was waiting in the cockpit of his plane for permission to take off. After spotting what he believed to be a meteor, he was told that the control tower's radar had detected unknown objects closing in on his position. Pierman observed six objects that he described as white, tailless, fast-moving lights over a 14-minute period. He was in radio contact with Harry during his sighting, and Harry later reported that each sighting coincided with a pip that could be seen near his plane. When he reported that the light streaked off at a high speed, it disappeared on the scope. Meanwhile, back at the Andrews Air Force Base, Staff Sergeant Charles Davenport observed an orange-red light to the south where the light would appear to stand still, then make an abrupt change in direction and altitude, with the phenomena happening over several times. At one point, both radar centers at National Airport and the radar at Andrews Air Force Base were tracking an object hovering over a radio beacon. The object vanished in all three radar centers at the same time. At 3 a.m., shortly before two United States Air Force F-94 Starfire jet fires from Newcastle Air Force Base in Delaware arrived over Washington, all of the objects vanished from the radar at National Airport. However, when the jets ran low on fuel and left, the objects returned, which convinced Harry that the UFOs were monitoring radio traffic and behaving accordingly. The objects were last detected by radar at 5.30 a.m. Now, the government later tried dismissing the events of that day on a temperature blip, but those who were present have been adamant otherwise. In third place, we have the Go Faster video. The video, uploaded by the UFO Investigative Group to the STARS Academy of Arts and Sciences in March of 2018, was secured by a Freedom of Information Act request to the U.S. government. The video was taken in 2015 off of the East Coast by an FA-18F fighter jet using the aircraft's onboard Raytheon AN-ASQ-228 Advanced Targeting Forward-Looking Infrared Pod, also known as the ATFLIR. I know myself too well. I'll trip over my tongue if I try saying that any more than I just did, so it shall be called ATF for short. It's not the official short form, but work with me here. ATF is designed to allow pilots to track, target, and destroy targets on the ground at ranges of up to 40 miles. It should be noted that ATF is good at spotting, but not engaging aerial targets. Now this video, nicknamed Go Fast by To The Stars, starts by explaining the various numbers and symbols that appear in the footage. You know, things like the aircraft's altitude, which was around 25,000 feet, and the fact that the ATF was pointed ahead and to the left of the Super Hornet. The readout also explains that the aircraft was traveling at 252 knots and in a five degree turn, and the unknown object was approximately 4.4 nautical miles away. The video shows the Super Hornet's weapons system operator repeatedly trying to acquire the UFO with the ATF's built-in auto tracker, which can pick out an object and keep it centered on camera. After two tries, the weapons system officer, or WSO for short, shouts, whoa, got it, to which another person assumed to be the pilot says, Woohoo! Woo! What the bleep is that thing? The pilot asks. The WSO later says, Oh my gosh, dude. To which the pilot replies, Whoa! 
what is that man? Now, this is where the skeptics would start asking, but Alexa, how is this unknown object different from, you know, weird government aircrafts we don't know about? Well, doubters, let me count to thy ways. For starters, the UFO doesn't have any kind of hot exhaust trail that would be emitted by a conventional turbine engine, appearing to emit, you know, no heat on the ATF sensor. And secondly, the UFO doesn't have any visible wings or fins. Through my research, I've learned that even like cruise missiles, such as the American Tomahawk, have small winglets that should be visible, and other missiles, such as the Maverick anti tank missile, still have little stubby fins. The UFO appears oval like and does not appear to fly nose first in the direction of travel. To quote from one of my favorite films, take that, Mr. Downing Mustafa. In second place, we have the Aguadilla UAP. Jonathan Lace, spokesman for the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies, SCU for short, explains that the organization believes the most compelling footage of anomalous activity ever taken was by a Homeland Security aircraft over Puerto Rico on April 25th of 2013. I'll let you folks make up your own minds in the comments. but. Let's get at it. The video was captured at around 9.20 p.m. on that fateful day as an unknown object flew across the runway of the Rafael Hernandez Airport in Aguadilla and was caught on infrared camera by a U.S. Customs and Border Protection aircraft, the footage of which was leaked to the SEU by an anonymous source. The eerie footage shows an object believed to be up to 5 feet in length, moving at speeds of up to 120 miles per hour, get close to the ground before seemingly plunging into the ocean and splitting into two. In a 50-page report, Report. The SEU has made notes that no bird, no balloon, no aircraft, and no known drones have that capability. It also appears to not disturb the water when plunging beneath and then re-emerging from the surface, a phenomenon known as transmedium travel. SCU investigators said that the object appears to be of unknown origin after spending a thousand hours researching the UAP in question. It is claimed that the pilots of a DHC-8 turboprop spotted a red light over the ocean. They then contacted the control tower who told them they did not know the identity of the object and then the object's lights went out as it approached the shore. The plane then engaged its thermal image camera and went on to follow the UAP. The SCU report concluded by saying that the video is the best documentation of an unknown aerial and submerged nautical object exhibiting advanced technology they've ever seen. They have since called for the release of more data from the Pentagon after the release of the Tic Tac, Gimbal, and Go Fast videos. In their statement, the SCU says that they believe that all government data regarding unidentified aerospace objects should be made available to the public to be openly investigated by the broader scientific community, provided that such data does not compromise sources or methods of data collection. Now, a full scientific investigation of such data would be able to uncover valuable information relating to both national security and advancement of our understanding of physics, aerospace engineering, and, you know, our world and beyond. Here's to hoping the Pentagon listens someday and releases that footage. If I've said it once, I've said it a million times. They just really need to stop being so cagey about what they release. They really don't release information unless they're forced to, and while I hate sounding like a broken record, they need to do better. And in first place, we have the Chicago O'Hare Airport sighting. At around 4.15 p.m. on November 7th of 2006, federal authorities at Chicago O'Hare's International Airport received a report that a group of 12 airport employees were witnessing a metallic, saucer-shaped craft hovering over gate C-17. The object was first spotted by a ramp employee who was pushing back United Airlines Flight 446, which was departing Chicago for Charlotte, North Carolina. The employee made the flight's crew aware of the mysterious object above their aircraft, and this unknown craft was also witnessed by, you know, pilots, airline management, and mechanics. So, a lot of people. No air traffic controllers saw the object, though, and it didn't show up on radar. What distance described the object as completely silent, 6 to 24 feet in diameter, and dark gray in color. Several independent witnesses outside of the airport also saw this object. One described, you know, seeing a disc-shaped craft hovering over the airport, stating that it was obviously not clouds, since the object shot through the clouds at a high velocity, leaving a clear blue hole in the cloud layer, which closed itself shortly after the events. According to a reporter at the Chicago Tribune, the disc was visible for approximately five minutes and was seen by close to a dozen United Airlines employees, ranging from, yep, pilots and supervisors who heard chatter on the radio and raced out to see it. Both United Airlines and the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA for short, initially denied that they had any information on this sighting until the Chicago Tribune filed a Freedom of Information Act request. The FAA then ordered an internal review of air traffic communications tapes to comply with the request, which, what do you know? uncovered a call by the United Supervisor to an FAA manager in the airport tower 
concerning the UFO sighting. If I haven't made myself obvious by now, I hate, 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 hate cover-ups, so I'm glad the Freedom of Information request was rightfully granted. UFO investigators have argued that the FAA's refusal to look into the incident contradicts the agency's mandate to investigate possible security breaches at American airports, such as in this case. The National Aviation Reporting Center on Anomalous Phenomena published a 155-page report on the sighting and has called for government inquiry and, you know, improved energy sensing techniques. Because if an airborne object can hover for several minutes over a busy airport but not be registered on radar or seen visually from the control tower, this creates a potential threat to human safety. Starting off, we have the original Roswell sighting. One simply cannot discuss aliens, UFOs, or anything supernatural without mentioning that fateful summer of 1947. Rancher W.W. Mack Brazil had found wreckage on his property in Lincoln County, New Mexico, roughly 120 kilometers north of Roswell, sometime between mid-June and early July, describing it as rubber strips, tin foil, and thick paper. The ranch had no phone and no radio, leaving Mac completely unaware of the ongoing flying saucer craze, so he gathered the debris and just pushed it under some brush to dispose of it. This was not the first instance of a flying disc spawning in the region, with several stories already being reported to the press that year. On July 5th, Mac drove into Corona, where he heard stories of silvery flying discs, and two days later, on July 7th, made the decision to bring the wreckage into the sheriff's office in Roswell. The sheriff called in the Roswell Army Airfield, which assigned the matter to Major Jesse Marcel. Mac brought Major Marcel back to the debris site, and the two gathered up more pieces of rubber and tinfoil, with the Major taking the materials home. On July 8th, Public Information Officer for the Roswell Army, Walter Hott, issued a press release stating that personnel from the field's 509th Operations Group had recovered a flying disc near Roswell. On that same day, Major Marcel took the material to his base commander, Colonel William Blanchard, who reported the findings to General Roger Ramey at Fort Worth Army Airfield. Poif for short. General Ramey ordered that the material be flown to Fort Worth immediately, leaving Marcel to board a B-29 Superfortress to make the flight. As soon as Marcel brought the material to General Ramey's office, both Ramey and his chief of staff, Colonel Thomas Dubose, identified the material as pieces of a weather balloon kite. The weather officer on duty explained to reporters that ray wind devices were used at around 80 weather stations across the country. The balloons were attached to a six-pointed reflective device that looked like a silver star. After launch, the balloon would expand with increasing altitude before bursting at around 60,000 feet with pieces dispersing and their fall to the ground. Now, after the initial newspaper reports of 1947, the Roswell incident faded from public attention for more than 30 years, until the late 1970s, which brings us to February of 1978, when UFO researcher Stanton Friedman interviewed Major Marcel, whose statements contradicted those he made to the press in 1947, saying, they wanted some comments from him, but he wasn't at liberty to do that. All he could do was keep his mouth shut. And General Ramey is the one who discussed, or told the newspapers, the newsman, what it was and to forget about it. It's nothing more than a weather observation balloon. Of course, they both knew differently. Now, while he didn't elaborate on that statement, and I wish he did, he did deny the popular theories at the time of any bodies being found near the debris. After the United States Congressional Inquiries, the General Accounting Office launched an inquiry and directed the Office of United States Secretary of the Air Force to conduct an internal investigation. A report released in 1994 concluded that the material recovered in 1947 was likely, keyword here, debris from Project Mogul, a military surveillance program employing high-altitude balloons in classified portions of an unclassified New York University project by atmospheric researchers. A scholarly consensus emerged concluding that the military had decided to conceal the true purpose of the crash device, allegedly nuclear test monitoring, and instead inform the public that the crash was of a weather balloon. The balloon had allegedly been launched from Alamogordo, I'm so sorry, Army Airfield a month earlier, carrying a radar reflector and classified Project Mogul sensors for experimental monitoring of Soviet nuclear testing. The Air Force reports were dismissed by UFO experts as being either disinformation or simply implausible. Yeah. Now, the scary part about all of this for me is counting how many times the government has changed its tale, expecting the general public to believe them each time. Which story do you believe? In fourth place, we have an anonymous report from 2013 from Athens, Texas. A retired military firefighter and commercial pilot, who was also a former astronaut, submitted his account of what happened around 10.15 p.m. 
on the evening of July 5th, 2013, to the National UFO Reporting Center, also known as New Fork. He reported that he and his family were sitting outside, and when he looked up into the sky, he observed a fairly large orange glowing orb moving rapidly overhead at around 90 degrees of elevation. A minute or two later, his whole family spotted a group of three similar objects along the same flight path as the first one. The objects allegedly gave off no sound and seemed to glow from atmospheric heating. He and his family attempted to record the objects using their iPhones, although the grainy dark video was of no evidential use. A direct quote from him reads, They moved much faster than orbital satellites, like the International Space Station, or airplanes, but much slower than meteors, and did not change brightness as a meteor would upon entering the atmosphere. So if a former astronaut and pilot has no explanation for what you witnessed, what the heck was it? In the middle of our list today, we're discussing a San Antonio spotting of seven donuts in the sky. On May 19th of 1952, an air crew flying an RB-36 reconnaissance aircraft reported spotting a series of, you guessed it, several donut shapes appearing in the sky, and were able to take photographs to accompany their incident report which can be found in National Archives. The crew of 22 reported flying just north of Sonora when they originally spotted the phenomenon, stating that the plane was headed on a 301 degree heading at 18,000 feet with the relatively calm winds for that altitude. At 8.05 p.m., the objects appeared just to the left of the bomber's nose at a range estimated by the crew to be around 80 to 120 kilometers ahead. The objects were stacked vertically from approximately 25,000 feet to 60,000 feet. And even with all the photographs and drawings, there is still no definite answer as to what was spotted. In second place, we have the Washington Flap. At 11.40 p.m. on Saturday, July 19th of 1952, Edward Nugent, an air traffic controller at the Ronald Reagan Washington National Airport, try saying that five times fast, spotted seven objects on his radar. The objects were around 24 kilometers south-southwest of the city, not following any established flight paths, and no known aircrafts were in that area. Edward's superior, Harry Barnes, a senior air traffic controller at that airport, watched the objects on the radar scope later writing that they knew immediately that a very strange situation existed. Their movements were completely radical compared to those of any ordinary aircraft they knew of. Harry had two controllers check Edward's radar, and they found it was working pretty normally. He then called the National Airport's radar-equipped control tower, and the controllers there said that they had unidentified blips on their radar screen, and that a hovering bright light in the sky was moving at speeds they couldn't understand. Now at this point, other objects appeared in all sectors of the radar scope, and when they moved over the White House and the United States Capitol, Harry then called the Andrews Air Force Base, which was located around 10 miles away. Although they reported that they had no unusual objects on their radar, an airman soon called the base's control tower to report uh-huh. The sighting of a strange object. Airman William Brady, who was in the tower, saw an object that appeared to be an orange ball of fire, trailing a tail, saying it was unlike anything he had ever seen before. Now where have I said that? Oh yeah. As William tried to alert the other personnel in the tower, the strange object took off at an unbelievable speed. On one of National Airport's runways, pilot S.C. Pierman was waiting in the cockpit of his plane for permission to take off. After spotting what he believed to be a meteor, he was told that the control tower's radar had detected unknown objects closing in on his position. Pierman observed six objects that he described as white, tailless, fast-moving lights over a 14-minute period. He was in radio contact with Harry during his sighting, and Harry later reported that each sighting coincided with a pip that could be seen near his plane. When he reported that the light streaked off at a high speed, it disappeared on their scope. Now, meanwhile, back at the Andrews Air Force Base, Staff Sergeant Charles Davenport observed an orange-red light to the south, where the light would appear to stand still, then make an abrupt change in direction and altitude, with the phenomena happening over several times. At one point, both radar centers at National Airport and the radar at Andrews Air Force Base were tracking an object hovering over a radio beacon. The object vanished in all three radar centers at the same time. At 3 a.m., shortly before two United States Air Force F-94 Star fire jet fighters, I'm really anxious on my airplanes today, <laughs> from Newcastle Air Force Base in Delaware arrived over Washington. All of the objects vanished from the radar at National Airport. However, when the jets ran low on fuel and left, the objects returned, which convinced Harry that the UFOs were monitoring radio traffic and behaving accordingly. Now, the objects were last detected by radar at 5.30 a.m. The government later tried dismissing the events of that day on a temperature blip, but those who were present have been 
adamant otherwise. In first place, we have the abduction of Betty and Barney Hill. Yeah, I know I said I'd be talking about UFO sightings today, but this event is a combination sighting and abduction that I just I couldn't leave off the list. The Hills were a married couple that lived in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Barney was employed by the United States Postal Service, while Betty was a social worker. They were active in the local Unitarian congregation, members of the NAACP, and Barney sat on a local board of the United States Commission on Civil Rights. Overall, they seem like pretty normal folks, right? Mm. The UFO sighting happened at around 10.30 p.m. on September 19th of 1961. The Hills were driving back to their home in Portsmouth from a vacation in Niagara Falls in Montreal. Just south of Lancaster, New Hampshire, Betty noticed a bright point of light in the sky that moved from below the moon in the planet Jupiter upwards to the west of the moon. While Barney was driving, Betty reasoned that she was observing a falling star. Only, it was moving upwards. Because it moved erratically and grew bigger and brighter, Betty convinced Barney to stop their car for a closer look as well as to walk their dog, Delcy. Barney obliged and stopped at a picnic area just south of Twin Mountain. Now by this point, Betty had dug out her binoculars for a closer look and described seeing an odd-shaped aircraft flashing multicolored lights travel across the face of the moon, believing it to be a flying saucer based off of stories she had heard from her sister. Now taking his turn with the binoculars, Barney thought it was just a commercial plane at first, but soon changed his mind because without looking as if it had turned, the craft rapidly descended in his direction causing him to realize something was wrong. The Hills said they continued driving on the isolated road, moving very slowly towards Franconia Notch in order to observe the object as it came even closer. At one point, the object passed above a restaurant and signal tower on top of Cannon Mountain and came out near the Old Man of the Mountain. Betty testified that it was at least one and a half times the length of the granite cliff profile, which was 40 feet long and it seemed to be rotating. At one point, the object descended rapidly towards their vehicle, causing Barney to stop in the middle of the highway. The huge silent craft hovered at around 80 to 100 feet above the hill's 1957 Chevrolet Bel Air and filled the entire field of view in the windshield. Barry stepped away from the vehicle and moved closer to the object, which he later said was roughly the size of a huge pancake. And uh, that statement right there just made me hungry. Still using the binoculars, Barney claimed to have seen 8 to 11 humanoid figures peering out of the craft's windows, seeming to look right at him. In his report to investigator Walter Webb of the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, NICAP, Barney described specifically that the beings were somehow not human, but humanoid. In unison, all but one figure moved to what appeared to be a panel on the rear wall of the hallway that encircled the front portion of the craft. The one remaining figure continued to look at Barney and communicated a message to him, saying, stay where you are and keep looking. Barney had a recollection of observing the humanoid forms wearing glossy, glossy black uniforms and black caps. Red lights on what appeared to be bat wing fins began to telescope out of the sides of the craft, and a long structure descended from the bottom of the aircraft. Now, the silent aircraft approached what Barney estimated was within 50 to 80 feet overhead and 300 feet away from them. Not arriving home until dawn, the Hill stated that they had some odd sensations and impulses they couldn't explain. Now, extremely confused, the Hill said they tried to reconstruct what had exactly happened the night before, but their memories were incomplete and fragmented. Notice I did a little bit of a jump there. That's because we don't know what happened. After sleeping for a few hours, Betty awoke and placed the shoes and clothing she had worn during the drive into her closet. Observing that the dress was torn at the hem, zipper, lining, and later noted a pinkish powder on her dress. Now, over the years, five different laboratories have conducted chemical and forensic analyses on the dress. This wasn't the only damaged items in their possession. Barney said that the leather strap for the binoculars was torn, but didn't remember how. The toes of his best dress shoes were scraped, and their watches were broken, and no matter what, never worked again. There were shiny, concentric circles, so similar to the rings that you would find on a tree trunk on their car's trunk, that had not been there the previous day. Betty and Barney experimented with a compass, noting that when they moved it close to the spots, the needle would whirl rapidly. But when they moved it a few inches away from the shiny spots, it would drop down. Ten days after the UFO encounter, Betty began having a series of vivid dreams, which continued for five successive nights. She stated that she experienced them with a degree of detail and intensity that she never had before. And after the fifth night, they stopped and never recurred, although they occupied her thoughts during the day. Determined to recover their lost memories, the Hills opted to partake in hypnosis sessions. Barney recalled driving the car away from the UFO, but afterwards he felt compelled to pull off the road and drive into the woods, eventually spotting six men standing on the dirt road. The car stalled, and three of the men approached the car, telling Barney not to fear them. He was still anxious, however, and he reported that their leader told him to close his eyes. While hypnotized, Barney said, 
I felt like the eyes had pushed into my eyes, a statement he would repeat each session. The best anyone has been able to rebut what happened was claiming stress and sleep deprivation as the cause of what they saw and experienced. I'll admit, I'm usually much more of a skeptic, but this seems pretty dang real to me. 